in this session we will try to complete the topic of internal flow and when we say internal flow we are going to focus on heat transfer for flow through a pipe and also for heat exchangers okay so let us first look at the details of flow through a pipe so here what you see is this is a pipe uh, of say circular cross section and this direction is axial direction indicated as x and from the axis this is radial direction now when a fluid enters let us say the velocity profile is uniform okay and it is going to be almost uniform if the entrance is uh, shaped in this way so if it is a gradually converging uh, sort of entrance then the velocity profile is going to be almost uniform here and then we know that from starting from this uniform velocity profile as it flows through this a boundary layer develops that is shown here so this is delta this is hydrodynamic or velocity boundary layer and this indicates the distance up to which the effect of wall has penetrated so at any section if we plot the velocity profile it will look like this so in this region in the core region the effect of wall has not yet penetrated but in the boundary layer that effect is there so velocity profile looks like this so this boundary layer keeps on growing and eventually it occupies the entire uh, domain of the pipe and from this point onwards, if you look at the velocity profile, it looks like this. Now, the region up to this point, that is called entrance region. And in this region, the velocity u, this is velocity in the x direction. Velocity in x direction depends on both x and r. You can see it is changing with x and it it also has a profile in the radial direction so this is a function of x and r from but from this point onwards if you see the velocity profile if the flow is say laminar you know this velocity profile is going to be parabolic and it remains as it is so u now is a function of r only it does not depend on x so we got a one dimensional flow situation and this is called the flow is fully developed so up to this point that's the entrance region and flow is developing but beyond this point the flow is fully developed and this distance from the from the entrance to the point when it becomes fully developed so i have indicated that as xfdh so this means the axial distance for fully developed flow and hydrodynamically fully developed so that is x f d h for flow through a pipe we define a Reynolds number based on diameter and that is rho times diameter of pipe times mean velocity because we don't have one velocity now we have a velocity profile if you see here we have a velocity profile so we define Reynolds number based on mean velocity over dynamic viscosity you can write that as umd over nu and this mean velocity um this is defined based on mass flow rate so if mass flow rate is m dot we can write m dot as density times cross section area of the pipe times this mean velocity so this is defined based on the mass flow rate so this is like an average velocity which will give you the same mass flow rate as is given by this velocity profile so that is the mean velocity which is used to define the Reynolds number we can substitute um by using this equation we can substitute m dot for that and you get this expression for Reynolds number so Reynolds number is 4 m dot over pi d mu we can use this expression also and we know that if Reynolds number is less than 2300 then the flow remains laminar if it is greater than 10,000 then it is fully turbulent and if it is in between that is the transition region that means sometimes it is laminar sometimes it is turbulent 
So Reynolds number is an important parameter in pipe flow. And we also have these expressions for x f d h. So this is the entrance length, hydrodynamic entrance length at which the flow becomes fully developed. So we have x f d over d, this ratio for laminar flow is in the range of 0 0.05 times Reynolds number. And if the flow is turbulent, then x f d over d for a turbulent flow, it does not depend on Reynolds number. Uh, it turns out to be in the range of 10 to 60. And we can also get an expression for velocity profile in the fully developed region for laminar flow that is given by this. U is negative 1 over 4 mu dp dx. This is pressure gradient times r0 square. This is the radius of the pipe times 1 minus r square over r0 square. So that is the parabolic velocity profile. I'm not going to derive this expression, but we do that uh, in fluid mechanics. Now this um, the mean velocity, is you can write it in this way also. This is integral rho u dA. We are integrating it over the entire cross section of the pipe. So if you take a differential area dA that is in, in the cross section of the pipe, then the mass flow through that is going to be rho u dA. And if you integrate it over entire area, that becomes mass flow rate m dot. So divide this with density times cross section area that is u m. And you can manipulate this. If this differential area dA is an annular area given by 2 pi r dr. So we can write it in this way and you get this expression. So the idea is if the velocity profile is given, then we can use that also to get this um, which is used to define the Reynolds number. So that was about the velocity profile. Now let us look at the thermal uh, points. So thermal considerations. So just like the velocity boundary layer, there is development of thermal boundary layer. So again, if we consider this pipe, this is the axial direction x and this is the radial direction r. And let us say the boundary condition, which is the surface of the pipe, is specified as one of these two things. Say we are given surface temperature Ts is constant or surface heat flux that is qs double prime this is surface heat flux or that is constant so these are the boundary conditions at the surface of the wall and say when fluid enters the pipe its temperature is uniform so we are showing it like this so again temperature is actually a scalar but for the purpose of representation uh, we show it like a vector because because it is very convenient so with respect to this base this indicates what is the temperature at any radial location. So right here it is uniform. If this surface temperature Ts is say greater than the temperature of fluid at entrance, then there is going to be heat transfer from the surface to the fluid. And at any distance, if we plot the temperature profile, for example, at this distance, the temperature profile will look like this. This point represents surface temperature and there is the boundary layer so temperature decreases and this is the region in which the effect of wall has not yet penetrated. So we can define this thermal boundary layer thickness delta T here but eventually you reach a point this point at which the effect of wall has penetrated the entire diameter. So this point the distance up to this point that is called thermal entry region okay. thermal entry region just like we had uh, the the hydrodynamic entry region this is thermal entry region and beyond this point you can say the flow is fully developed thermally okay. previously we talked about flow is fully developed hydrodynamically now beyond this point it is fully developed thermally in the entrance region, in the thermal entry region, the temperature profile T is a function of both X and R. Okay. It varies in the axial direction 
and also there is a profile in the radial direction. Now, the interesting thing is if you look beyond this point also, actually temperature remains a function of x and r. It is not that temperature is a function of r alone. This temperature profile, see this profile, it keeps on changing. For example, say surface temperature is constant. If surface temperature is constant, let us say at this location, temperature profile is like this. Now, as you keep on going in the x direction, temperature profile is going to become like this. And eventually, if the pipe is infinitely long, it will become uniform. Everywhere you will have same temperature as surface temperature. So the temperature profile keeps on changing, even though it is fully developed. And similarly, if you have constant surface heat flux, then actually the surface temperature also keeps on changing. So you may wonder, what is the meaning of fully developed now? Because hydrodynamically, we say a flow is fully developed when velocity depends only on R. If it does not depend on X, then we say it is fully developed. But now temperature depends on X and R both. We'll talk about that in a while. What is the meaning of fully developed in this case? And we can write an expression for XFD thermal. So this is the thermal entry length at which point the flow becomes fully developed thermally. So the ratio of this to diameter for a laminar flow is in the range of 0 0.05 times Reynolds number and Crantle number. Okay. Now in order to define convection heat transfer from the surface, we need a reference fluid temperature. For example, previously dis we discussed that when we have flow over a flat plate, then if you remember, let's say this flat plate, we have flow over it, and the temperature of fluid here is T infinity and plate surface temperature say is Ts. So we define say surface heat flux Qs double prime as local convection coefficient h times Ts minus T infinity. So we took this T infinity as the reference temperature for defining convection coefficient and it was very convenient because there is such a thing as T infinity and even though there is heat transfer from plate to the fluid, but this T infinity remains constant. So it was very convenient to define it in this way. But now when we have flow through a pipe, then temperature profile is like this. So if this represents surface temperature, we don't even have such a thing as T infinity in this case and temperature at any point keeps on changing as we move in the x direction. But we need a reference temperature to define convection coefficient. So I have written here this Qs double prime which is H times Ts minus T reference. This reference temperature is taken as what we call the mean temperature or the average bulk temperature or the mixing cup temperature. They all mean the same thing. This is the reference temperature called mean temperature, average bulk temperature or the mixing cup temperature and it is defined in this way. So if we take any section, say this section, then the enthalpy advection through this section we can write as see, rho is density times velocity times dA. This is differential area. So that represents differential mass flow rate times specific heat Cp times temperature. That is enthalpy advection. And if we integrate it over entire area, so that is enthalpy advection. And if we write that as equal to enthalpy advection based on a mean temperature Tm, that will be m dot cp tm. So this mean temperature is defined in this. Okay. So that we are going to use as reference temperature. 
And this temperature is actually, if you look at it, this mean temperature Tm is the temperature attained if fluid passing a cross section is collected and mixed. So although you have a temperature profile here, but whatever fluid is flowing through this, if you are able to mix it and then see what is the temperature attained by that fluid, that will be this Tm. So that's why it is called the mean temperature or the mixing cup, temp cup temperature. But this mean temperature is not constant. It is a function of x okay, because of heat transfer. This is not like T infinity. Okay, it, it changes in x direction. So that is the reference temperature that is used to define the convection coefficient h. Okay, now let us look at the thermally fully developed region. So say temperature profile is like this. This is the axial direction x and this is radial direction. And say the surface temperature Ts, this is also a function of x. Okay. Now we can write temperature profile T is a function of both x and r. But it turns out that if we write a non-dimensional temperature in this way, Ts minus T over Ts minus Tm. This is non-dimensional temperature. So this Ts and Tm, they are function of x, whereas T is a function of x and r. So this non-dimensional temperature, it does not change with x in the fully developed region. So although this temperature profile itself is changing, but this non-dimensional temperature does not change. And this situation is attained if we have these boundary conditions, if surface temperature of the pipe is constant or surface heat flux is constant. For example, you have, let us say, a heater wrapped around the pipe, which has a constant, which is giving a constant surface heat flux. So for these situations, in the fully developed region, although temperature profile changes, but this non-dimensional temperature, that does not change. That is why it is called fully developed. Okay. So we can say that Ts minus T over Ts minus Tm is not a function of x in the fully developed region. We can differentiate this with respect to R. So what you get is Ts minus Tm, they depend on x only. So they remain as it is, Ts minus Tm. Differentiation of this with respect to R will be zero because this does not even depend on R. So you'll get negative. This will become dt dr. So that is the differentiation of this with respect to R. And we can evaluate this at R equals R zero. That is the surface of the pipe. Okay. So this thing also will not be a function of x. Because if this thing is not a function of x, then when you differentiate that, that is also not a function of x. So based on this, now say Qs double prime, this is surface heat flux. We can write that as K del T del R at R equals R0. That is based on Fourier's law. And you may wonder why the negative sign is not there. Okay, let me explain that. So you see the surface heat flux, surface heat flux is going to be negative K times dt, not of dr, but see r direction is this, but we have to take a derivative in this direction. That is the surface heat flux. So it is opposite to r. So that is why the negative sign goes away. So Qs double prime is K dt dr at r equals r0. This is based on Fourier's law because at the wall you only have conduction, fluid is at rest. This is thermal conductivity of the fluid. This equals H, convection coefficient, times Ts minus Tm. We are using Tm to define the convective heat transfer. So H, Ts minus Tm. And see what we have here is because this whole term is not a function of X what you get is h over k. Okay, h over k is actually this thing. 
that is also not a function of x. So if you take thermal conductivity is constant, you get h is not a function of x. So we got this very interesting result that in the fully developed region, convection coefficient does not vary with x. So if I plot h as a function of x, okay, up to this point flow is developing and beyond this it is thermally fully developed. And in this region now see h is a constant. And before this actually h increases. H increases because temperature gradient at the wall is actually higher in this region because the flow is still developing. So that is the profile for H. And remember that in the fully developed region, although temperature profile keeps on changing, but the non-dimensional temperature does not change and the convection coefficient also remains constant. That is the meaning of fully developed here. Now the main thing we want to talk about first is how to get the value of this convection coefficient h because once we have that we can use the equations for energy balance to solve various problems. So how to get the convection coefficient h or get the Nusselt number because Nusselt number is just a non-dimensional convection coefficient. So let us talk about determination of Nusselt number. Now, if the flow is laminar and if we take flow as incompressible, so density is constant and we are taking constant properties, that means thermal conductivity and uh, viscosity, specific heat, all those are constant. And say the flow is fully developed and it is flowing through a circular tube. Okay. Then for this situation, we can actually derive an expression for Nusselt number theoretically, just based on the equations. We are not going to derive the all the things, but I'm just going to give you an idea that what is the procedure. So here you see if this is a pipe, this is the axial direction x and this is radial direction r. In order to determine convection coefficient, so first, we, first we need to determine what is the temperature profile in the pipe. The approach is similar to what we did for external flow over a flat plate. Just like the Blasius solution, we determine what is temperature profile and based on that you can get what is temperature gradient at the wall and you can get what is Nusselt number. So you have to get what is temperature profile. And the procedure for that is we take a differential control volume. So this is the differential control volume. If its length is dx, okay, so this is an annular region, say at a radius of r, we take this radius dr and its length is dx. So this is an annulus, that is the control volume. And we write an energy balance equation for this. So here you see an enlarged view of this. So we just have to see in what way energy is going into the control volume and coming out of the control volume and just balance those because we are talking here only about steady state situation. Now in the radial direction there is no advection okay, because the flow is only in the axial direction so there is no flow in the radial direction so all you have is energy transfer because of diffusion and expression for that will be this QR diffusion in the radial direction will be negative k a area is 2 pi r dx times del t del r this is based on Fourier's law that is qr and what comes out at radius r plus dr will be based on taylor series expansion qr plus del qr over del r times dr this comes out Okay, that's all. We don't have anything else in the radial direction. In the axial direction, we have flow that is called advection. And energy that enters at this phase because of flow will be, see the density rho times velocity u times area 2 pi r dr. Okay, this area is 2 pi r dr. So this represents the mass flow rate through this phase. 
okay this represents the mass flow rate so m dot times cp that is specific heat times temperature okay so this is the advection of enthalpy here and we are neglecting kinetic energy and potential energy because those effects even if we include in these situations we are talking only about low speed situations so those effects are going to be negligible okay so that is enthalpy advection from the left face and from the right face it will be if you say this term is q1 from the right face it will be q1 plus del q1 over del x times dx now apart from this there will also be diffusion or conduction from this phase and this phase but it turns out that the diffusion is actually negligible we can safely neglect that term okay. so if we do that then that's all okay. so we do an energy balance just energy in equals energy out and that will be a second order equation in temperature okay. and we can solve that equation with the boundary conditions boundary conditions will be temperature gradient at r equals 0 has to be 0 because of symmetry and at the surface say temperature is specified so those are the boundary condition so i haven't solved those here but we can solve for the temperature profile and we get what is temperature as a function of r and x by using this approach and once we have temperature profile we can get what is nusselt number so you get Nusselt number and Nusselt number for pipe flow is defined based on the diameter of pipe. So this is convection coefficient times the diameter of pipe over thermal conductivity of the fluid HD over K. It turns out to be 4.36 if surface heat flux is constant and 3.66 if surface temperature is constant. Okay, so those are the expressions we get for flow through a pipe fully developed with constant properties but the main thing is these are valid when the flow is laminar okay. when the flow is turbulent there are no theoretical expressions we cannot derive any expressions but we have empirical correlations so let me show you those so for fully developed turbulent flow in smooth pipe we have a correlation that this is Ditas Bolter correlation. And this is given as Nusselt number based on diameter is 0 0.023 times Reynolds number to the power 4 by 5 times Prandtl number to the n. Where n is taken as 0 0.4 for heating and 0 0.3 for cooling. So if the fluid is getting heated then n will be 0.4 if it is getting cooled it will be 0.3 and this correlation is valid for Prandtl number between 0 0.6 and 160 and for Reynolds number greater than 10,000 so you see this is fully turbulent Reynolds number 10, 000, greater than 10,000 for pipe flow that is fully turbulent and while using this expression all properties like for Nusselt number unit thermal conductivity for Reynolds number, you need viscosity. We also need uh, Prandtl number. So all those properties are to be evaluated at mean temperature. At the reference temperature we took, properties are evaluated at that temperature. So this is one of the correlation based on which by knowing the Reynolds number and Prandtl number, we get Nusselt number or the convection coefficient. Another very popular correlation is it is called Sider Tate correlation. So, this is by Sider and Tate, and this is Nusselt number based on diameter is 0 0.027 times Reynolds number to the 4 by 5 times Prandtl number 1 third times mu over mu s to the 0 0.14. And this is valid for Prandtl number between 0 0.7 and uh, 16,700 that's actually very high value of parental number so it spans a very wide range of parental number and for Reynolds number greater than 10,000 and in this relation also all properties 
are evaluated at mean temperature except mu s okay mu s is evaluated at the surface temperature okay that, that is another uh, important correlation so see this correlation it, it won't work for liquid metals for liquid metals parental number is very small of the order of 0 0.01 so for liquid metals there are different uh, correlations okay okay now so we talked about flow through a pipe when we have non circular tubes we can still use the same correlations but now what is going to be the diameter they don't have any diameter non circular tubes let us say the cross section is square or it is rectangle or it is triangle we can use what is called hydraulic diameter dh okay so we can use this diameter to define uh, the Nusselt number and Reynolds number. And this hydraulic diameter is defined as for cross section area AC over perimeter P. Okay. So if you evaluate this for a circular pipe, it will, it will turn out to be D itself. See for cross section area for a circular pipe is pi by 4 D square and perimeter is pi D that will turn out to be D. But this expression we can use for other types of cross section. So that is hydraulic uh, diameter. And with this hydraulic diameter, we can use the same correlations uh, by, uh, I gave you by Dieters and Bolter and by Sider Tate, we can use those correlations. For example, if we take flow through a concentric tube annulus. So what you see here is this tube has diameter di this outside tube has diameter do and flow is in this annular region okay, so it is not like a circular pipe so what is hydraulic diameter see hydraulic diameter dh which is four times cross section area so you have four and what is this cross section area it will be pi by four do square minus di square that is cross section area over perimeter perimeter is going to be see this length which is pi d i plus this which is pi d o so perimeter is pi d o plus d i and if you evaluate this you get hydraulic diameter is d o minus d i okay so just to give you an example okay, okay so so far we discussed about uh, what is this mean temperature for flow through a pipe that we use as a reference temperature for defining convection coefficient and what are the correlations for getting the Nusselt number. Now let us look at the overall energy balance for tube flow or flow through a pipe. If this is a pipe and let us say its inlet is I so fluid enters at I and exit is O, that is outlet. Okay. If we take a differential control volume here of length dx and do energy balance on this. From the left face, we have advection and we can define that based on the mean temperature Tm. So it will be M dot Cp Tm. Okay, that's all. We are neglecting diffusion in the x direction, which is actually negligible. From the right face, you have advection out. That will be m dot cp tm plus dtm. Now, apart from these, from the surface, you have heat transfer because of convection. So that is this dq convection. We can write that as qs double prime. This is surface heat flux times the surface area. Surface area will be P dx, where P is perimeter of the pipe. Okay. That is surface area for uh, convection heat transfer. Or we can also write this as H, H is local convection coefficient, times surface area, which is P dx, times temperature difference, Ts minus Tm. So if surface temperature is Ts, mean temperature is Tm, we can write it in this way also. Okay. So that is the energy balance on this. And you just do energy in equals energy out. 
and we get this expression dtm dx equals qs double prime p over m dot cp which is also equal to p over m dot cp times ts minus tm. So this is the equation that is going to give us mean temperature as a function of x. How mean temperature varies from inlet to outlet this equation. Okay. So this is uh, see we are using this equation not to get temperature profile in the radial direction. We did not take a differential control volume in the radial direction. We took in the axial direction so that we get an equation that gives us mean temperature as a function of x. Okay, let us look at what this equation becomes for the case of constant surface heat flux. So for the case of QS double prime equals constant. So the equation is dTm over dx is Qs double prime P over m dot Cp. But if Qs double prime is a constant, you see this whole thing is a constant. Okay, this whole thing is a constant. So you get dTm dx is a constant. So the mean temperature increases linearly. Okay, increases or decreases depending on the surface heat flux. It is positive or negative. It changes linearly. We can integrate this expression between inlet I and any location X. So you get this mean temperature at location X is mean temperature at inlet plus QS double prime P over M dot CP times X. Okay, because this thing is a constant. Its integration is straightforward. Okay. If you plot it, so if you plot temperature with x, see Tm varies linearly with x, you get this. It is just a straight line that is mean temperature. Okay. Now we have Qs double prime equals H Ts minus Tm. that is the definition of H. We use this temperature difference to define H. And in the fully developed region, H is a constant. Okay, if H is a constant and Qs double prime, this is already a constant. We took the case when surface heat flux is constant. So what you get is this Ts minus Tm, this is a constant. Okay, so that is why you see dTs dx will be equal to dTm dx and that is what you see if from this point onwards if the flow is fully developed then see Tm varies linearly and Ts also varies linearly they have same slope okay. and in this region this is the thermal entry re region in this region because H is large I talked about this previously the profile of H is H is large in this region and it is constant in this region. Because H is large, this Ts minus Tm is going to be small. That is why Ts is like this. Okay. So I hope you get the idea that for the case of constant surface heat flux, Ts increases linearly in the fully developed region and Tm also increases linearly in the fully developed region. So if you plot temperature profile, let, let me do that. Okay, let us say this is pi. And say the condition is surface heat flux is constant. Then at this location, if temperature profile is like this, this temperature profile, at any downstream location, the profile is going to be similar but just shifted so it is now say like this okay. and it increases linearly so you can see, see this profile 
has just become shifted so every temperature has increased by the by the same amount this is the case with uh, constant surface heat flux okay. the other possibility we consider is when surface temperature is constant and we are going to talk about that later on not at this point okay let me do one example on this let us see number 50 okay it says water its specific heat is given 4.18 kilojoule per kilogram kelvin it enters a pipe at a rate of 0 0.01 kilogram per second so let's say this is pi and the mass flow rate is 0 0.01 kilogram per second at a temperature of 20 degrees C. Okay, this actually what is given is mean temperature. If it does not give temperature profile, if it just gives one temperature, then implicit in that is it is talking about mean temperature. So mean temperature here, let us call this as mean temperature at inlet is 20 degrees. The pipe diameter is 50 millimeter and length is 3 meter. So its diameter is 50 and length 3 millimeter. It is subjected to a wall heat flux Q wall double prime. So there is heat flux from the wall and then it says if Q wall double prime is 5000 that is in watt per square meter. So this Q wall double prime if this is 5000 watt per square meter. The temperature in degree Celsius at the inner surface of the pipe at the outlet is so see if this is inlet and this is outlet the okay, flow is in this direction we have to determine temperature at the inner surface of the pipe so that is temp temperature of the right right here that is surface temperature ts okay, at the outlet this temperature okay. so how to do this See, we have, we have two expressions we can use. We can write, and actually one information is given, I forgot to mention. It says, the convection heat transfer coefficient at the pipe outlet is 1000 watt per square meter Kelvin. Okay. So, the convection coefficient here, that means H at the outlet, I am just writing that as HO is 1000 watt per square meter Kelvin. If we do an overall energy balance between inlet and outlet, I can write M dot Cp TMO minus TMI equals Q wall double prime times the area from which this uh, this heater is acting that will be pi dl okay this is overall energy balance see m dot cp tmo minus tmi this is change in enthalpy of water this will be equal to how much is heat transfer so q wall double prime times pi dl and we are given m dot cp tmi okay all these things are given so this equation will actually give us tm okay, that is mean temperature at the outlet 
and then at the outlet we can also write see, qs double prime equals convection coefficient h times ts minus tm okay we can apply this relation at any location okay and we can apply this at outlet also so we have qs double prime we have h at outlet given and this mean temperature given so this will give us ts okay and we had to find this number okay so now i'm just going to plug numbers so in this equation see mass flow rate is 0 0.01 kilogram per second times cp for water is given as 4.18 that becomes 4180 in joule per kilogram kelvin times tmo minus tmi tmi is 20 degrees c equals q wall double prime that is 5000 times pi diameter is 0 0.05 meter and length is 3 meter so plug numbers that gives us tmo is you got 76.33 degrees C. That is mean temperature at outlet. And now use this expression. So QS double prime, that is uh, 5000 equals H. H is 1000 at outlet times TSO minus TMO, that is 76.33. So this gives TSO is 81.36 degrees. Okay. So that is the answer for the first part. And see what we did is we used how convection coefficient is defined. It is defined based on the mean temperature, so TS minus TM and that is the heat flux and we used an overall energy balance on the entire pipe. Okay. Now look at the second part of this. Okay. Now it says if Q wall double prime is 2500x, so it is not constant heat flux now, it depends on x, where x is in meter and in the direction of flow x equals 0 at the inlet. The bulk mean temperature of the water leaving the pipe in degree Celsius is. So now what we have is we have Q wall double prime equals 2500 x. So it is not constant surface heat flux. Okay. So to do this, we'll have to take now a differential control volume in x direction. So if I take this control volume, let's say its size is dx, then energy balance on this will give See, uh, we got m dot cp. Okay. If see temperature here is tm. Here it is tm plus dtm. Okay. And you have the surface heat flux. So your energy balance will be m dot cp dtm equals q wall double prime times the area from which you have that heat transfer pdx okay p is perimeter of the pipe so this is heat transfer by convection okay. so this will be equal to change in enthalpy of this so m dot cp dtm so based on this now you can write dtm change in mean temperature equals q wall double prime that is given as 2500x 
times perimeter perimeter is pi d over m dot cp we are given these numbers also okay m dot cp times dx and we can integrate this expression integrate this from inlet to outlet So when you do that you get TMO equals TMI plus 2500 pi D over M dot CP times integral of X DX that becomes half X square and you put the limits inlet is at X equals 0 outlet is at say X equals L. So times half L square. Okay, now just plug numbers. We have CP, M dot, diameter, and length. Okay, so when you plug numbers in this, you get this is We just did energy balance, but because heat flux was a function of x, we took a differential uh, control volume in x direction and then integrated it from pipe inlet to pipe outlet. Okay. Now, We'll talk about heat exchangers before we do more problems because heat exchangers constitute a very important application of internal flow. And in heat exchangers, the classic, there are actually many types of heat exchangers and I'm just going to introduce the basic types. The classification is based on flow arrangement and construction. For example, the simplest is what we call a concentric tube or double pipe construction. So in this actually you have two pipes which are concentric. What you see here is this is one pipe and there is another pipe outside this and they are concentric. Okay. And we can have different flow arrangement. One flow arrangement is parallel flow. In this there are two fluids they are moving in the same direction that is why it is called parallel flow so you have one fluid moving in this direction in this pipe and another moves around it in the annular region because you have concentric pipes another enters here moves around it and comes out here so it's parallel flow so the two fluids they are not mixing but across this surface there is going to be heat transfer between them so we call this as parallel flow heat exchanger. We can also have counter flow. In this, they move in opposite directions. So if one fluid is moving in this direction, other fluid moves in the opposite direction. That is why they are called counter flow. So there is parallel flow, counter flow. We can also have cross flow. So that you see in this figure. So these are the tubes through which one fluid is flowing in this direction and another fluid is in cross flow okay, like this it flows in this direction. So the axis of these tubes is like this and the flow this flow is actually perpendicular to the axis of these tubes so that is cross flow and these you can say these are fins that are attached to these tubes. So you can also have a construction in which there are no fins, but this is an example of cross flow. In terms of construction, we have this shell and tube heat exchangers, which are very common. And in these, we have an outer shell. So what you see here, this represents an outer shell and inside there are many tubes there is a tube fluid which enters here it says tube in it flows through these tubes and comes out here okay. 
and another fluid flows around those tubes in the shell so that it flows like this and it comes out here so between these two uh, there is heat transfer so that is shell and tube uh, heat exchanger and what you see here these are baffles which which have multiple purposes uh, they are used to support these tubes uh, that is one reason uh, so they have a structural purpose they also reduce vibrations and they also introduce turbulence on the shell side because of that heat transfer is increased and this configuration here what you see is that is actually a single shell and tube pass so if there is a single shell pass what that means is fluid enters the shell and then comes out it's a single pass and tube also there is single pass it enters flows and comes out that is single pass we can also have multiple passes for example schematically here what you see is this is one shell pass and two tube passes so the shell pass is like this shell fluid enters here it flows through this in one direction and then comes out so that is one shell pass but you have two tube passes tube flow is like this that is one pass and then it goes like that so we have two tube passes and you can have multiple tubes actually but all of them have uh, two passes you can have two shell passes okay so in two shell passes it will be like this shell fluid goes like this flows like this and then again inside the shell it flows in another direction and then comes out here so that will be two shell passes and then you can have also depending on uh, how many times tubes are passing through that you can have four tube passes so that is shell and tube uh, construction. In the analysis of heat exchangers, and we are going to focus on parallel flow and counter flow heat exchangers. There are two methods. One is what is called log mean temperature difference or LMTD that is log mean temperature difference method so first let us talk about this so first let us take a parallel flow heat exchanger so schematically we just show like this so there is hot fluid that is flowing in this direction and cold fluid that is also flowing in the same direction and between hot fluid and cold fluid they are separated by this surface so there is heat transfer across this surface so this is a parallel flow heat exchanger okay. let us say inlet temperature of hot fluid is th1 outlet temperature is th2 for cold fluid it is tc1 outlet is tc2 so one we are indicating as inlet and two is outlet and say m dot h is mass flow rate of the hot fluid cph is its specific heat and m dot c and cpc those are for the cold fluid now we can write energy balance this q this is rate of heat transfer and if we take this whole thing as the control volume okay, this entire hot fluid section as the control volume then the rate of heat transfer from the hot fluid to the cold fluid across this boundary that is q we can write that as m dot h cph times th1 minus th2 okay so this is mass flow rate times specific heat times change in temperature so this is the amount of heat loss the rate at which hot fluid is losing heat that is rate of heat transfer okay and this equals rate at which heat is gained by the cold fluid because heat transfer is from hot to cold so if we draw control volume around this around the cold fluid and there is heat transfer right here this q you can also write q is m dot c cpc t 
Tc2 minus Tc1. So this is increase in temperature of cold fluid. Okay. And see the way we have written Q is it is positive. Th1 minus Th2 this is positive and Tc2 minus Tc1 this is positive. So this is rate of heat transfer just simple based on an overall energy balance. There is another way to write this uh, heat transfer. Let us look at that. So we have hot fluid flowing in this direction and cold also flowing in this direction. Okay. If we take a differential control volume here like this or like this, this is a differential control volume of size say dx. Okay. Then say the temperature of hot fluid here is Th and when it comes out here is Th plus dth. This dth can be negative also, so temperature decreases, doesn't matter. So temperature at inlet is Th, outlet is Th plus dth. Temperature of cold fluid is Tc, at outlet it is Tc plus dtc. And there is heat transfer across this surface that we are indicating as dq and this is heat transfer from hot fluid to cold fluid. Okay. We can write expression for dq by using hot fluid or cold fluid, just energy balance on this control volume or this control volume. That becomes dq is negative m dot h cph dth based on hot fluid or m dot c cpc dtc based on cold fluid. Another way we can write this heat transfer is if the overall heat transfer coefficient between hot and cold fluid is u, this is overall heat transfer coefficient. And if you remember, we talked about this previously. Uh, let us say you have composite cylinders. So there is fluid flow inside one cylinder and then there is another layer of cylinder outside it, another layer of cylinder and then you have fluid outside. So we can define an overall heat transfer coefficient between inside and outside. So that is this U here. We'll talk more about this uh, a little later. But this represents an overall heat transfer coefficient. So we can write this dQ in this way also. It will be U times area dA. This is not cross section area. This is this area across which this heat transfer is happening. So U D A times temperature difference T H minus T C. So this is analogous to Newton's law of cooling. In Newton's law of cooling, you write rate of heat transfer is H A times temperature difference. Here we are writing U A temperature difference because this is the overall heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Now we can write D T H equals u d a t h minus t c over negative m dot h c p h just take this on that side you get an expression for d t h similarly you get for d t c and we can write d t h minus d t c equals this okay. now if we define t h minus t c is delta t this is temperature difference between hot and cold fluid at this location okay so this is not a constant because the temperature of hot fluid keeps on changing with x this also changes with x so delta t keeps on changing this is okay th minus tc is delta t then this becomes d delta t and we can bring this term on the right hand side that becomes delta t so this equals negative u times 1 over mh dot cph plus 1 over mc dot cpc da. We get this expression. Now if we assume u is constant, okay, this although temperatures are changing but this overall heat transfer coefficient does not change, u is constant and we integrate this between 1 and 2. 1 is inlet, 2 is outlet. Okay, see our approach is like this. We are taking a differential control volume. 
writing an expression and integrating this between inlet and outlet. So when you integrate this, this becomes log delta t, d delta t over delta t, that is log delta t. So this becomes log delta t2 over delta t1 equals negative u, this integral becomes a. And this is not cross-section area, this is the area across which heat transfer is happening between the two fluids. Okay. So negative u a times th1 minus th2 over q. For this expression, we can substitute this. And for this, we can substitute this. So we get this. Okay. And we can manipulate it further. And you can write log delta T2 over delta T1 equals UA over Q times TH2 minus TC2 minus TH1 minus TC1. And this term, see this is TH minus TC. So this is delta T, but evaluated at point 2. So this is delta T2. TH minus TC, this is also delta T, but evaluated at 1. So this is delta T1. So the expression we get for Q is Q equals U A delta T2 minus delta T1 over log delta T2 over delta T1. And this term here, this is called log mean temperature difference. We write that as delta T LM. This is called log mean temperature difference. So our expression for heat transfer becomes Q equals U A delta T L M. And we did this for a, uh, for a parallel flow heat exchanger. And I'm going to elaborate this further and give a lot of examples on using this equation. Uh, but an implicit thing I did not mention you, I should have mentioned is when we are writing these equations we are saying that there is no phase change okay there is no let me elaborate on that okay, let us say you have hot fluid flowing through this and if we take this as control volume so this is inlet this is outlet mass flow rate is m dot and say rate of heat transfer here is q then based on energy balance q is actually m dot times h i minus h o mass flow rate times change in enthalpy between inlet and outlet and we are neglecting kinetic energy and potential energy so those terms change in kinetic energy change in potential energy those are actually negligible uh, in these problems okay. if we say that there is no phase change So there is no like boiling or condensation that type of situation then this q will become m dot this change in enthalpy we can write as cp times change in temperature and this is valid for both if we have ideal gas and also for liquids If it is valid in either case okay. but if there is phase change okay then this is not valid 
okay then you have to retain it as it is so q equals m dot times h i minus h o because if phase change is happening you may have that this temperature equals this temperature so there is no change in temperature but there is heat transfer because of uh, uh, change in latent enthalpy okay during boiling and con condensation you still have heat transfer so we have to retain this expression okay so implicit in the derivation that we did to get q equals u a delta t l m implicit in that was that there is no phase change happening okay. and then only we write it like this that q is m dot h c p h t h 1 minus t h 2 which is m dot c c p c t c 2 minus t c 1 if there is no phase change happening okay so finally the situation is like this so if you have a parallel flow heat exchanger so hot fluid is flowing in this direction cold fluid is flowing in this direction okay. and we should while doing the problems it is always good to draw a temperature plot how temperature changes with distance if it is a parallel flow heat exchanger then they both enter from say point 1 and they flow in the same direction so their temperature profiles are going to be like this so temperature of the hot fluid it enters here and this indicates the direction in which it is flowing so it decreases okay. and temperature of the cold fluid cold fluid flows in the same direction but this temperature increases and this temperature difference th minus tc let's say that is delta t1 and this temperature difference here that is delta t2 so this delta t lm that is log mean temperature difference okay, that is defined as delta t2 minus delta t1 over natural log of delta t2 over delta t1 that is log mean temperature difference you can also write it as delta T1 minus delta T2 over log of delta T1 over delta T2. You get the same answer. So it doesn't matter what you indicate as 1 or 2. You'll get same this log mean temperature difference. Okay. And this represents sort of an average. Because see, at this location temperature difference is this much and it keeps on decreasing at this location temperature difference is this much and at any location say location this location okay heat transfer is u times the differential area da times this temperature difference but when we integrate it to get the total rate of heat transfer over the entire length we get this temperature which represents sort of an average and the value of delta t l m will be in between delta t1 and delta t2 so you can verify uh, partially you can verify your answer that after you evaluate delta t l m its value should be in between these two values okay okay now another scenario is when we have counter flow so the counter flow heat exchanger will be like this so in this pipe say there is hot fluid flowing in this direction and cold fluid in this pipe it flows in the opposite direction and there is heat transfer across this surface so that is counter flow if we plot temperature profile for this okay say hot fluid it flows in this direction it temperature decreases cold fluid it flows in opposite direction and its temperature increases so they will look like this okay and we can do the analysis that we did for the parallel flow and I, i'm not going to do that but if we do that analysis we find that 
the same equation that we got for parallel flow q is u a delta t l m is also applicable for counter flow you can derive that as a practice but i'm not going to do that so same equation is valid okay but now at this location if this is delta t1 at this location if it is delta t2 based on these we define delta t lm okay so the difference is you see this delta t1 this is actually temperature of hot fluid at inlet minus temperature of cold fluid at outlet so this point is inlet for hot and this is outlet for cold okay that is how this delta t1 is whereas for a parallel flow both of these are inlet okay both of these are outlet so whereas for counter flow if one is inlet other is outlet this is inlet this is outlet but still in taking delta t1 and delta t2 we just take okay this location and this location what is the temperature difference between hot and cold fluid and based on that we define log mean temperature difference and we do the same thing uh, for parallel flow in that sense they are same okay. now a few observations are temperature of cold fluid at outlet can be greater than temperature of hot fluid at outlet for a counter flow configuration okay this is possible so temperature of cold fluid at outlet that is this temperature okay this temperature can be greater than temperature of hot fluid at outlet that is this temperature because they are flowing in opposite direction whereas it is not possible for a parallel flow so for a parallel flow this situation is not possible okay. another observation is for same inlet and outlet temperatures delta t l m for a counter flow heat exchanger is greater than delta t l m for a parallel flow heat exchanger for same uh, inlet and outlet temperatures okay so what that means is if delta t for counter flow is greater than delta t for parallel flow and you have this expression q is u a delta t l m you see if delta t is large then for same heat transfer rate you need smaller area so heat exchanger will be smaller so what you get is that the counter flow heat exchanger will be smaller okay counter flow heat exchanger will be small so let me summarize the equations we need finally for doing the problems we can write q this is rate of heat transfer equals m dot h c p h times t h i minus t h o so this is based on energy balance on the hot fluid so rate of change of enthalpy in the hot fluid equals rate of heat transfer and we can also write that as m dot c c p c t c o minus t c i this is based on cold fluid and they are also equal to u a delta t l m so for doing the problems based on l m t d method we actually you'll see we actually need just these equations which are actually just common sense and very easy to remember also now let us consider some special cases one special case is if we have say m dot h times c p h if this is very large let us say this approach is infinity okay. so if this approach is infinity that means the temperature of hot fluid is not going to change temperature of hot fluid is almost constant okay. so that i have indicated like this so the temperature of hot fluid this remains constant okay or you will get temperature of hot fluid is constant in this situation also when hot fluid is condensing because while condensing 
if pressure is constant it is going to condense at constant temperature let us say steam is condensing so steam becomes water if the pressure does not change and you consider neglecting the effect of friction so in a pipe pressure doesn't change then temperature also doesn't change so while condensing it will have same temperature okay so this is th but the temperature of cold fluid is increasing so this is a special case okay now the equations we derived those equations were valid when there is no condensation okay i explained that but it turns out that even for this equation this situation we can use those uh, equations so even for this one you can actually use q is ua delta t lm i'm not going to do the derivation but it is valid okay even in this situation when you have condensation or you can write this as m dot c times cpc times tco minus tci or you can write this as based on hot fluid if you want to write this will be mass flow rate of hot fluid times enthalpy of hot fluid at inlet minus its enthalpy at outlet okay don't write cp delta t because temperature is constant there is no delta t for the hot fluid so, so you can write it like this like this and like this so even when there is condensation uh, it is applicable okay another similar si uh, scenario is if m dot c cpc is very large that means that temperature of the cold fluid is going to remain constant or let us say cold fluid is evaporating then also its temperature will remain constant if pressure is constant evaporation its boiling will happen at constant temperature so for this situation if we plot temperature for the cold fluid it is constant and for the hot fluid now it decreases like this because there is heat transfer from hot fluid to cold fluid and same expressions are valid so to be explicit let me write those so when you have say okay cold fluid evaporating so you have tc is constant now so q is u a delta t l m you can write this based on hot fluid m dot h c p h times t h i minus t h o or based on cold fluid we'll have to use enthalpy so this is enthalpy of cold fluid at outlet minus its enthalpy at inlet because for the cold fluid we have uh, phase change its temperature is constant so don't write cp delta t it, it has no meaning okay. so this is the situation and for these two scenarios okay for these two scenarios it does not matter whether the heat exchanger is parallel flow counter flow or it could even be cross flow it does not matter okay reason for that is one temperature is constant okay so see the this fluid hot fluid whether it is flowing in this direction or in this direction does not matter because its temperature is constant and this temperature difference that is relevant for heat transfer will not change uh, in whichever direction it flows and same is the situation here so because this remains constant it does not matter if this fluid is flowing in this direction or in this direction so parallel flow and counter flow they are identical uh, in terms of performance in this situation okay 
and these cases case 1 and 2 they also apply to what we call single stream heat exchangers okay, single stream heat exchangers so let me explain what that means so as the name indicates we are saying single stream heat exchanger that means flow is actually in only uh, one stream there are not two streams there is only one stream so what you have here is for example consider this pipe and a fluid flows in this in this direction okay and there is heat transfer between this and say between surrounding and the surrounding is at t infinity okay so this is at so see this is there is heat transfer between this and this and if we plot temperature profile and let us say this t infinity is greater than the temperature here so there will be heat transfer from this to this but see how the temperature profiles look like t infinity is just a constant Okay, T infinity is constant and the temperature of cold fluid between inlet and outlet from 1 to 2 that will increase. Okay, so this is a single stream heat exchanger and for this also the equations we derived those equations are valid. Okay. So this difference here will be delta T1, this difference here will be delta T2. And we can write Q as U A delta T L M. Okay, just like the analysis we did. Or we can write this as M dot C P. Now you have only one M dot. Okay, so mass flow rate of this times its C P times its temperature change T2 minus T1. Okay, we can write it like this. And this expression we can actually further manipulate a little bit for this particular situation. Let me explain. See this delta T L M. Okay, for this particular situation it will be if you want to write this as delta T2 minus delta T1 over log delta T2 over delta T1 okay this becomes delta T2 is T infinity minus Tc2 or let me just write T2 T infinity minus T2 and delta T1 is T infinity minus T1 okay. over log delta T2 over delta T1 and this becomes see, T infinity will cancel so this becomes actually uh, negative of T2 minus T1 over log delta T2 over delta T1 okay, because this T infinity will cancel you get this for delta T L M okay. and we can substitute this expression here Okay, so U A delta T L M which is this T1 minus T2 over log delta T2 over delta T1 equals M dot C P T2 minus T1 and based on this you see T2 minus T1 it will cancel and you get log delta T2 over delta T1 equals negative U A over M dot C P. Okay, many times we will see we will use this equation. So, so the basic idea is whether it is a parallel flow heat exchanger or it is a counter flow heat exchanger or it is single stream heat exchanger in which what you have is one fluid is flowing through a pipe and it is exchanging heat with surrounding okay that's all 
So in all cases, we have actually the same equations that are applicable. Another special case is if we have counterflow heat exchanger along with m dot c cpc equals m dot h cph if this is the situation okay. then you will get actually delta tc equals delta th because energy balance is m dot cp delta t that is q and if m dot cp they are equal for cold and hot fluid their temperature changes will be equal and if the hot fluid is flowing in this direction and this is its temperature profile and it is counter flow so cold flows in this direction so the temperature difference between them this delta t it actually remains constant if this is the situation okay, if this is the situation this delta t remains constant okay so what you get is delta t1 equals delta t2 equals delta t l m so to get this log mean temperature difference don't use the formula we have uh, actually the formula we have for delta t l m if you use that formula that will give you zero over zero so that is indeterminate so for this situation because temperature difference is everywhere same between cold and hot fluid so log mean temperature difference is actually the temperature difference at any location so that is a special situation okay, now finally let us talk about this overall heat transfer coefficient we assume that the overall heat transfer coefficient u is a constant but let us see how we evaluate that so let us talk about the description of this u a okay for example consider a pipe its inside radius is r i its outside radius is r o it is made of a material of thermal conductivity k and there is one fluid flowing inside and another flowing outside and there is heat transfer between them okay. so we can draw based on assuming one dimensional heat transfer in the radial direction we can draw a thermal circuit that will look like this so this represents temperature of fluid here say ti this will be the mean temperature okay because convection coefficient is defined based on mean temperature so this is mean temperature of fluid here ti from this to this surface there is resistance due to convection that is 1 over h a and if we take the length of this pipe okay perpendicular to the board if the length is 1 so we are working based on heat transfer per unit length so i have written q prime for that that is rate of heat transfer per unit length this becomes 1 over h i and the area that is available for heat transfer that is 2 pi r i okay 1 over h i 2 pi r i 2 pi r i so this is resistance for convection here now between this point and this point there is resistance due to conduction in the tube and that resistance we derived this previously it will be given by log r o over r i over 2 pi k we have taken length as 1 this is q prime then from this point there is convection to this fluid and resistance for convection will be 1 over h a so you write 1 over h o this is convection coefficient on the outside times this area for heat transfer on the outside that is 2 pi r o and finally you reach this temperature of fluid here T O this is again the mean temperature of the fluid both of these are mean temperatures of the fluid okay so this represents the resistance for heat transfer between inside and outside now along with these at these surfaces see at this surface and this surface we are going to add additional resistances and those are called fouling factors and these fouling factors are due to rust formation 
because there is going to be some chemical reaction between the fluid that is uh, flowing and the pipe material and because of that there can be rust formation some other forms of surface damage formation of some deposits on the surface which are going to pose additional resistance to heat transfer so those are called fouling factors and fouling factors are just like contact resistances they are given in terms of resistance per unit area okay so their units are actually if you want unit of fouling factor you'll find their units are like this uh, kelvin meter square per watt okay. kelvin meter square per watt so we will have resistance at this surface and i have added that here you see at this node which represented this surface so if we add here another resistance between this and this that will be this fouling factor on the inside say rfi double prime divide this with area 2 pi ri because this is given based on per unit area okay so you have to divide this with the area to get the resistance there and similarly at this location you have rfo double prime this is fouling factor on the outside over area there 2 pi r so this is the thermal circuit for heat transfer between inside and outside. So based on this you can write see Q heat transfer per unit length which is temperature difference delta T. So this is actually delta T is C. Uh, if you take between I and O you just write T I minus T O over this resistance. Okay, over total resistance and this prime indicates it is per unit length we took length is one so q prime which is delta t over resistance is equal to u a delta t and again we are taking this area per unit length okay so we can write like this or alternatively you can write q equals u a take off this prime and take of this prime everywhere so you are considering its length is l you are not working with per unit length so based on this you get 1 over u a equals total resistance and i have written that here so 1 over u a equals total resistance which would be 1 over h i times 2 pi r i l plus this is the fouling factor on the inside resistance due to tube fouling on the outside and convection on the outside this is 1 over u a okay so this is the descri description of u a because rate of heat transfer q is u a delta t l m so we are going to need u a and we can determine that if we know convection coefficient on the inside and outside and all these fouling factors based on assuming validity of one dimensional heat transfer in the radial direction uh, we can get this okay. and also pay attention to see this a is different if we take on the inside this area is 2 pi r i l whereas this area is 2 pi r o l okay so a depends on the radial location that we are choosing so that is why we are not writing 1 over u we are writing 1 over u a so effectively you can say that u a is a constant so you can evaluate u i a i so this is overall heat transfer coefficient with respect to ai this will be equal to u o a o okay so that's why we just write u a a special situation is if r i equals r o so you are saying that the pipe is very thin okay then r i is approximately equal to r o 
then what will happen is all these areas are same so they will cancel you see all these areas because ri equals ro they will cancel and this resistance will be zero so your equation will become 1 over u equals 1 over hi plus 1 over ho plus this fouling factor okay you are just adding inside and outside so this will be the case if it is mentioned that pipe is thin so in that case you have just one area ro equals ri you have just one area and area cancels from all these locations area cancels so you get this expression for one over Okay, let me summarize uh, this LMTD method and then we are going to do uh, several problems on this. So this LMTD method for analysis of heat exchangers is useful if we are given this information. Let us say we are given mass flow rate, specific heat of fluids, overall heat transfer coefficient U and we are given three out of four temperatures there are four temperatures two temperatures for hot fluid two for cold fluid inlet and outlet temperature so if out of those four temperatures if we are given three temperatures then the procedure will be first you calculate the unknown temperature the fourth temperature that is unknown first we'll have to calculate that so then we have all four temperatures okay. so we can plot the temperature profiles depending on whether it is a parallel flow heat exchanger or counter flow heat exchanger we can plot the temperature profiles and we can calculate delta t l m we should calculate delta t l m only after plotting temperature profiles then we won't make mistake okay so calculate this and then we use the expression q equals u a delta t l m uh, we can obtain the required area of the heat exchanger and for shell and tube heat exchanger see in case of shell and tube heat exchanger we the flow is actually not parallel flow or counter flow it also depends on number of passes okay there is also a cross flow component so the log mean temperature difference for them is defined in this way it will be log mean temperature difference for a counter flow heat exchanger times a correction factor f and generally in the problem this correction factor might be specified so you calculate delta t l m for a counter flow situation first multiply that with a correction factor that gives us delta t l m for that particular heat exchanger and then we can use the same formulas q equals uh, u a delta t l okay so let us do some examples illustrating these ideas so let us look at 51 it says in a condenser of power plant steam condenses at a temperature of 60 degrees c so that means it remains at constant temperature of 60 degrees c the cooling water enters at 30 degrees c and leaves at 45 degrees c the log mean temperature difference of the condenser is so very simple problem so before you determine log mean temperature difference first plot how temperature profiles look like so in this case for steam it is 60 degrees c and for water it enters at 30 and leaves at 45 and see because one of the temperatures is constant it does not matter whether the heat exchanger is it is parallel flow or counter flow it does not matter okay 
So let us say I draw like this. So this temperature at entrance is 30 and this is 45. And let us say it does not matter it flows in this direction or in that direction. So delta T L M will be we take delta T at this location. See so this is 15 and delta T at this location here it is 30. So we can take delta T2 over minus delta T1. So let us say I do 15 minus 30. Okay. Over log of delta T2 over delta T1, 15 over 30. Okay, that's all. So we just need delta T at one location and the other location at the extremities and then do this. So you just plug numbers and you get 21.64 degrees. And see this temperature is in between these two. Here it is 30, difference is 30. Here it is 15. It has to be in between these two. Okay, let us see 52 and this is a conceptual problem we don't have to do any calculations it says for the same inlet and outlet temperatures of hot and cold fluids the log mean temperature difference is it is greater for parallel flow than for counter flow or greater for counter flow or it is same or it depends on the properties of the fluids. Actually, if you have same inlet and outlet temperatures, then the counter flow heat exchanger has greater LMTD. So answer will be B. Okay, counter flow heat exchanger has greater LMTD than parallel flow. And reason for that is also easy to understand. But actually, so, so answer for this problem, let me say 52, answer will be B. But say we have a situation like this. Let us say this represents temperature of hot fluid. and this represents cold fluid. Okay, so both were undergoing phase change. So that is why their temperatures are same. Okay. So now see LMTD actually will not depend on whether it is parallel flow or counter flow. It will be same. Okay, everywhere you have same temperature difference. So it will be same whether it is counter flow or parallel flow heat exchanger. So the the statement of the problem is a little ambiguous it says for same inlet and outlet temperatures of hot and cold fluid so does it mean that temperature of hot fluid is same at inlet and outlet and temperature of cold fluid is also same at inlet and outlet if that that is the situation so if situation is like this okay then answer will be c it is same for both parallel and counter flow heat exchanger if this is the situation then answer will be C. Okay. But if the statement just means that temperatures are same in the sense that their values are same. So temperature of hot fluid is changing between inlet and outlet. Cold fluid is also changing between inlet and outlet. But their values are same whether it is counter flow or parallel flow. Then which one has higher log mean temperature difference? then answer will be B. Okay.
Okay, let us say 53. says the LMTD of a counterflow heat exchanger is 20 degrees C. So you are given delta T LM and it is counterflow. It's 20 degrees C. The cold fluid enters at 20 degrees C. So it is always good to draw a temperature profile. Let us say cold fluid enters here and comes out here so it is like this so its inlet temperature is 20 and hot fluid enters at 100 degrees C because it is counter flow hot fluid will flow in the opposite direction so it is like this this is hot fluid and this is 100 degrees C mass flow rate of the cold fluid is twice that of the hot fluid so mass flow rate of cold fluid is twice that of hot and the specific heat at constant pressure that is cp of the hot fluid is twice that of the cold fluid so you have specific heat of cold fluid uh, is half that of the hot fluid okay this is given uh, the exit temperature of the cold fluid is we have to determine okay what is temperature here the exit temperature of the cold fluid so let us say tco okay. we have to determine this temperature See now immediately we should recognize that m dot c cpc equals m dot h cph. Okay. So m dot c is same. So this is a special case. This is a special case. That means this temperature difference and it is counterflow. It is counterflow with this special case where you have m dot c. So you have m dot c cpc equals m dot h cph and it is counter flow that means delta t is same everywhere so this temperature difference this temperature difference is same everywhere so you can write delta t itself is delta t ln And you can write that as delta T. If I evaluate at this point, that will be 100 minus TCO. So 100 minus TCO. This is delta T LM, which is given as 20. So you get TCO is 80. Okay. So it was a special case. Let us see number 54. It says hot oil is cooled from 80 to 50 degrees C in an oil cooler which uses air as the coolant the air temperature rises from 30 to 40 degrees c so we are given all four temperatures oil goes from 80 to 50 and air goes from 30 to 40. the designer uses a lmtd value of 26 degrees c 
the type of heat exchanger is what type of heat exchanger is this whether it is parallel flow counter flow cross flow or another option it gives is double pipe actually double pipe means concentric pipe so it means it could be anything it could be parallel flow or counter flow okay both are double pipe uh, heat exchangers okay so to answer this we'll have to consider different situations let us see what will be lmtd if this heat exchanger were was parallel flow so for parallel flow so flow if i'm plotting temperature profile see oil goes like this it goes from 80 to 50 and air goes from 30 to 40 and if it is parallel flow they are going in the same direction so then see temperature profile will be like this okay so air goes from 30 to 40 so for this situation what is delta t lm and i'm writing that as parallel flow this will be delta t2 see right here that is 10 minus delta t1 that is 50 over log this over this and you get this number as uh, 24.85 You get 24.85 degrees C. So that is if it were uh, parallel flow. Now, if we consider counter flow, then how it will look like? Okay, so hot fluid, it goes from 80 to 50. And cold is now in opposite direction. So it enters here and its temperature increases. So it goes in this direction like this. So it enters at 30 and exits at 40. Okay. So this is counter flow. So what will be delta T L M for counter flow? It will be right here. So this difference is 20. So 50 minus 30 that is 20 minus this difference here 80 minus 40 that is 40 over log 20 over 40 and that turns out to be 28.85 degrees C. so first you recognize that for same inlet and outlet temperatures in this we kept you see same inlet and outlet temperatures lmtd for a counter flow heat exchanger is greater than that for a parallel flow this number is around 29 this is around 25 so counter flow heat exchanger has higher lmtd now the problem says that the designer used a value of 26 which is in between these two it is higher than parallel flow but less than counter flow that means it is cross flow. Okay, so answer will be cross flow. Okay, so the log mean temperature difference, it is maximum for given temperatures, it is maximum for a counter flow heat exchanger, it will be minimum for a parallel flow heat exchanger, and if it is cross flow, it will be in between. So answer will be. Uh, D. Okay, answer for this is D. Okay, let us look at number fifty five.
Celsius. In a condenser, water enters at 30 degrees C and flows at the rate of 1500 kilogram per hour. The condensing steam is at a temperature of 120 degrees C and the cooling water leaves the condenser at 80 degrees C. Specific heat of water is given and the overall heat transfer coefficient is given. Then the heat transfer area is. Okay. See what you have is if you plot temperature profiles water enters at 30 and it leaves at 80 degrees C. So it looks like this. So water enters at 30 and leaves at 80. So its temperature increases and there is steam condensing at 120 degrees C. So that temperature remains constant. Steam is condensing at 120 degrees C. So that is, let us say, this temperature is 120 degrees C. Okay, now it does not matter whether the uh, heat exchanger is parallel flow or counter flow because this one of the temperatures is constant. It does not matter whether this fluid is flowing in this direction or in that direction. Okay. So we have, we are given mass flow rate of water and we also have specific heat of water and the overall heat transfer coefficient u. Okay, these values are given. So the problem is very simple. If we write Q, this rate of heat transfer. It is just U A times delta T L M. This equals because we are given these two temperatures 30 and 80 degrees C. We can write based on energy balance on this water. So this will be mass flow rate of water times specific heat of water times change in water temperature. So water temperature at outlet minus water temperature at inlet. Okay. M dot Cp change in temperature that is same as Ua delta Tlm. Okay. So now uh, we are given uh, we need to determine delta Tlm. Or let me just plug numbers here u is given 2000 so 2000 times area is a delta t l m that will be delta t 2 so 120 minus 80 that is 40 okay right here temperature difference is 40 so 40 minus right here it is 120 minus 30 that is 90 so 40 minus 90 over log 40 over 90 okay that is delta tlm equals mass flow rate of water it is 1500 kilogram per hour so divide this with 3600 that becomes kilogram per second times specific heat of water it is 4.187 but convert this to joule so it becomes 4187 times change in temperature of water which is 80 minus 30 so that is 50 so this gives you a that a is approximately 0 0.7 square meter okay, so very simple problem q is ua delta tlm equals based on energy balance on one of the fluids okay, that gives us the answer Let us look at 56. Okay. This one says an uninsulated air conditioning duct of rectangular cross section. Okay, now it is not a pipe of circular cross section, it has a rectangular cross section, 1 meter by 0.5 meter. Let me draw its cross section is like this. 
that is 1 meter by 0.5 meter. And let me also draw how it looks like. Okay, so if this is the duct, and from the side view, it looks like this. It is carrying air at 20 degrees C. So there is air at 20 degrees C with a velocity of 10 meter per second. And it is exposed to an ambient of 30 degrees C. So outside, let me call that as T infinity. Outside is 30 degrees C. Neglect the effect of duct construction material. Okay, that means take that the the, the the duct material is very thin, so it is not posing any resistance to heat transfer. Neglect the effect of duct construction material, and for air in the range of 20 to 30 degrees C, we are given these numbers. Okay, for air, we are given thermal conductivity dynamic viscosity, parental number, and density. Okay, these properties are given. Then it says the laminar flow Nusselt number is 3.5 for constant wall temperature conditions. Okay. So the Nusselt number, if the flow is laminar, is 3.4 let me write here. So Nusselt number if the flow is laminar. I'm just writing that as L or let me write laminar is 3.4. And if the flow is turbulent, then Nusselt number is for turbulent flow is 0 0.023 times Reynolds number to the 0 0.8 times parental number 0.33. Okay, so these correlations are given. Then it says the Reynolds number for the flow is we have to determine the Reynolds number and the heat transfer per meter length of the duct in watt. Okay, heat transfer per meter length and the Reynolds number for the flow. Now, it does not have circular cross section and we discussed that for this situation, Reynolds number will be defined based on hydraulic diameter. Okay, so we'll have to determine hydraulic diameter. Hydraulic diameter, which is four times cross section area over perimeter. So four times cross section area this is 1 meter by 0.5 meter, so its cross section area is 0.5 okay. over perimeter which will be 1 plus 1 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 that becomes 3 perimeter is 3 so this gives hydraulic diameter is 0 0.666 meter okay. so Reynolds number will be defined based on this so now Reynolds number, which is rho v dh over mu, and these values are given. So I'm just going to plug density is 1.2, velocity is 10 meter per second, hydraulic diameter 0.666, and dynamic viscosity is 18 times 10 to negative 6. Okay, these numbers are given. So you get Reynolds number is 4.44 times 10 to the 5. Okay, that is one. Okay. Then the problem says we have to determine the rate of heat transfer. Uh, heat transfer per meter length of the duct. Okay, heat transfer per meter length of the duct. So for that, first we need to determine convection coefficient. Okay. Now see this Reynolds number is greater than 2300. So that means flow is turbulent. 
the flow is turbulent so we are going to use this correlation Nusselt number is 0 0.023 times Reynolds number to the 0 0.8 uh, and parental 0.33 and these numbers are actually given we are given parental number Reynolds number we already calculated so that gives us Nusselt number okay. and this Nusselt number just like Reynolds number is defined based on hydraulic diameter so it will be convection coefficient h this convection coefficient on the in, inside times diameter hydraulic diameter over thermal conductivity of air hd over k okay so we plug numbers we already have hydraulic diameter and thermal conductivity is also given actually this gives h is 25.59 watt per square meter Kelvin. Okay, this is convection coefficient. Okay. Now, actually, the way this problem is worded, it is very incomplete. Because in reality, what will happen is okay, this is pipe will have a convection coefficient hi on the inside and also on the outside say outside is ho okay and then temperature here is t infinity okay uh, but there is no flow outside outside flow is not given so heat transfer on the outside is actually by natural convection okay. but the way this problem is worded is we are just going to neglect that okay i just wanted to point out that in reality you have convection coefficient on the inside and outside and then based on these we need to write down an overall heat transfer coefficient based on one over u equals one over hi plus one over h o So you'll get actually U is uh, HI HO over HI plus HO. Okay. Let me think for a second. If HO is very small, then the out HO will be important actually okay so the way i'm going to do this problem is we will not even consider not even uh, consider the effect of ho in reality that should be done so i'm just saying that u is same as hi okay u is same as hi okay okay we have to determine heat transfer per unit length so ideally I should write Q equals see the situation is like this if I plot temperature profile so this is T infinity this is given as 30 degrees C and air enters at 20 degrees C and its temperature will increase like this so this is 30 okay this is 20 and its temperature will increase so this is like a single stream heat exchanger okay single stream heat exchanger so q will be based on u a delta t ln okay but let me make an approximation first if i say that this temperature of air it's 20 degrees here it is not going to rise much okay it's just a length of one meter okay just length of one meter and see convection coefficient is small convection coefficient we calculated was 25 watt per square meter kelvin it, it's a small value so if air temperature is not going to rise much so it is almost 20 there okay 
then when I evaluate this log mean temperature difference, it will be just this value 30 minus 20, it will be just 10. Okay, it is it is 10 here temperature difference and it is going to be almost 10 here. So, so if I just take this as 10, an approximation. So I can write Q is UA delta T and that becomes U is 25.59. So 25.59 times area. Area is the surface area. That will be because it is a rectangular section, 1 meter by 0.5 meter. So its surface area will be its perimeter, which is 2 times 1.5. That is the perimeter times length. Length we are taking as 1 meter. This is area the surface area. So H A times delta T L M, I am just taking a value of 10. So it turns out to be, this number turns out to be 769 watt. Okay. And based on this number, let me verify if this temperature is indeed very close to 20 degrees. So I can do that by writing Q equals mass flow rate of air times Cp of air times temperature of air at the outlet minus temperature at inlet. So if I plug numbers in this, see m dot, this will be the cross section area which is 1 meter by 0.5 meter, this is area times velocity, velocity is given 10 meter per second times its density. Density we have is as given 1.2. Okay, this is mass flow rate times specific heat. Specific heat of air is actually it is not even given here. Uh, we are given density viscosity, thermal conductivity and parental number. Based on that we can evaluate Cp. Let me show you how. See parental number is nu over alpha or it is nu over alpha is k over rho Cp. So this becomes mu Cp over k. We are given parental number, viscosity and thermal conductivity. So this will give us Cp. But I know Cp for air in the range of 20 to 30 degrees C it is around 1.005. So if I just use that number uh, or we can evaluate based on this. I am just using say 1.005 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin or you can evaluate based on this expression. So it will be 1005 times T O minus T I. Okay, you will get, if you actually evaluate it, you will see that T O minus T I is very, very small. So that means this temperature difference between this point and this point is very small. So the taking log mean temperature difference at just this temperature difference was valued. Okay, so that is an approximation. Okay. But if we don't want to do that, if we don't want to do that, then I can write Q is U A delta T L M, which is equal to mass flow rate of air times C P of air times temperature of air at the outlet minus inlet. I can write it like this. Okay. And this delta T L M, this will actually be U A. So it will be log of so it will be T infinity minus T O that is temperature difference here, minus T infinity minus T i. So that actually becomes 
minus T O plus T I over no sorry it will be this over log of T infinity minus T O over T infinity minus T O okay, this is log mean temperature difference equals m dot a c p a t o minus t i i can cancel t o minus t i see this is on this side and this is also on this side and i'll just put a negative sign here. Okay. so what you get is log t infinity minus t o over t infinity minus t i We get log t infinity. Let me plug numbers also. t infinity is 30 minus t o over t infinity minus t i. t i is 20. You will get this equals negative u a over m dot c p. Negative u is 25.59. Area is its perimeter twice times 1.5 times length is 1 meter this is area u a over m dot c p uh, m dot is its density times area area cross section area is 1 times 0.5 density times cross section area times velocity that is 10 so this term is m dot times cp around 1005 okay this gives us to we got 20.1265 degree c and once you have this we can use q is u a delta t l m and just plug numbers in this you get 762 okay, so that is the answer okay so let me clarify a, a couple of things see this area in ua this is not the cross section area this is area across which heat transfer is happening so this is the surface area where convection is happening okay. but when we determine mass flow rate for mass flow rate we are using density times cross section area of the duct times velocity okay so this was an example of you can say a single stream heat exchanger for a single stream heat exchanger when we write delta t l m and we write q in this way actually you always get this term cancels with this term and you end up with an equation let me write that equation here because you always get that you get log of say t infinity minus t o over t infinity minus t i equals negative u a over m dot c so you, end, you end up with this. This equation actually uh, ends up with this. So that was number 56. So let us look at 57.
Okay, this one says consider a thin walled tube of 10 millimeter diameter. So it says thin walled that means its inside and outside radius you take they are same. So thin walled tube its diameter is 10 millimeter and 2 meter length. Water enters the tube at mass flow rate of 0.2 kilogram per second. M dot is 0 0.2 and mean temperature at inlet is 47 degrees C. This is mean temperature at inlet. It says if the tube surface is maintained at 27 degrees C. So the surface temperature is constant that is 27 degrees C. What is the outlet temperature of water? Okay, outlet temperature of water. Okay, then it says assumed Tm bar. See Tm is mean temperature and Tm bar is the average of mean temperature. So assume average mean temperature equals 300 K for properties. And at 300 K if you see in the problem it also lists various properties for water at 300 K these things are given you have its viscosity, parental number, thermal conductivity and CP okay those values are given. Okay. Okay, so problem is like this. So water flows through a pipe. its temperature increases no its temperature at inlet is 47 degree C we have to determine its temperature at outlet okay. and the surface temperature of the tube is 27 degree C okay. actually this is also a single stream heat exchanger we also a single stream heat exchanger because see this stream is exchanging heat okay with something that is outside of it and whatever is outside of it is maintaining the surface temperature at 27 degrees C so it is exchanging heat with something that is at 27 degrees C so if I draw its temperature profile Okay, you have this one thing which is at 27 degree C. So this is 27 or no, let me draw in a different way. Okay, not this one. So the surface is at 27 degree C and then water enters at 47 and it is going to get cooled because surface is at lower temperature so it will be like this so it enters at 47 we have to determine what is the temperature here okay so this is also a single stream heat exchanger in in case of a single stream heat exchanger what you can have is there is fluid flowing through a pipe and you are given surface temperature of the pipe okay that is a possibility or you are given T infinity that is temperature outside and there is heat transfer between this fluid and T infinity that is also a single stream heat exchanger. The only thing is we have to consider what is this U okay, for different situations. Now for this situation see Q is that is U A delta T L M and this is also equal to mass flow rate of water times its specific heat times mean temperature at inlet minus outlet. 
I am taking inlet minus outlet because inlet temperature is greater than outlet temperature. So this term is positive. And this is UA delta T L M. Actually, this expression for the single stream heat exchanger, this becomes we manipulated it for the last problem. This actually becomes log TMO minus T S over T M I minus T S equals U A over M dot C P. Let me see if this is right. Okay, I think that is right. You get this. Okay. We are given T S that is twenty seven degree C we have TMI, we have to get TMO. Uh, mass flow rate is given, specific heat is given and we also know the surface area for heat transfer we need U. And U in this case is because there is heat transfer from this to the surface. So the only resistance is resistance due to convection here. Okay, that's all. Okay, resistance between the surface and the fluid is resistance due to convection. So U is actually H, the convection coefficient. So U in this case is just H. Okay. And to get H, first we determine Reynolds number. which is rho v d over mu or we can also write as based on mass flow rate 4 m dot over pi d mu that becomes 4 mass flow rate is 0 0.2 kilogram per second over pi diameter is 0 0.01 meter and viscosity is that is given 855 times 10 to negative 6. So that gives us Reynolds number is 29783. So we get Reynolds number. And for this Reynolds number flow is turbulent. Okay. So we are going to use a correlation for Nusselt uh, number and I am using the Ditas Bolter. which is Nusselt number is 0 0.023 times Reynolds number to the 0 0.8 times Prentel number to the N and N depends on heating or cooling. In this problem we have water is getting cooled and for that N is 0 0.3. So this is the correlation. Okay. So now I can write HI this convection coefficient on the inside times diameter over K that is HI pipe diameter is uh, 0 0.01 meter over thermal conductivity of water how much that is given that is 0 0.613. equals 0 0.023 times Reynolds number. We already have that 29783 to the 0 0.8 and Prentel number for water that is 5.83 to the 0 0.3. So this gives us convection coefficient. So you get HI is 9080 watt per square meter. 
and remember that while using this equation okay while using this equation these properties thermal conductivity and for calculating reynolds number viscosity all these properties we have to use at mean temperature okay this is not at surface temperature this is at mean temperature but if mean temperature itself keeps on changing because there of heat transfer the mean temperature itself keeps on changing so then you are taking the mean of the mean temperature to evaluate the properties and the problem itself said that if you read the statement assume the mean of mean temperature as 300 k for evaluating properties and at 300 k these are the properties so we use those properties in the correlation Okay, so we got H now, and now we have to just plug numbers. So if we plug numbers in this equation, okay, where this term is now, U is H, area is pi dl, and we are given M dot and Cp. We just plug numbers in this equation, that gives us Tm. So you get TMO is 37.1 degrees. Okay. So again, see we are using the equation that is valid for a heat exchanger. This was a single stream heat exchanger and the, the overall heat transfer coefficient between the fluid and the surface with which there is heat transfer was just due to convection. So U is just H in this case. And we determined H based on Reynolds number. The second part of this problem says that what is exit temperature of water? if it is heated by passing air over it in cross flow with V equals 10 meter per second and T infinity is 100 degrees C assume Tf this is film temperature equals 350 K for calculation and we are also given for air at 350 K and one atmosphere we are given kinematic viscosity, parental number and thermal conductivity. Okay. So now the situation is for part B. I am drawing the cross section view of this now. This is the pipe. Then outside of this okay, we have fluid flowing air flowing actually with a speed of 10 meter per second and t infinity is 100 degree c it is in cross flow okay okay so now see for heat transfer between this fluid and this there is resistance due to convection here and then there is no thickness of the pipe so there is no resistance there and resistance due to convection on the outside also okay so for this case 1 over u will be 1 over h o plus 1 over h i okay. because if you draw the thermal resistance let us say this temperature is t infinity this is mean temperature on the inside so this resistance will be 1 over h i a and this is 1 over h o a and 1 over u a is sum of all these resistances so that is 1 over h i a plus 1 over h o a and this a cancels So to get U, we need H I and H O. Okay. So let us do those things quickly. 
So in the first part, we calculated the Reynolds number already. And the Reynolds number was on the inside. Okay. It was 29783. And the flow on the inside was turbulent. And now the correlation that Nusselt number is 0 0.023 times Reynolds number to the 0 0.8 times parental number to the it won't be 0 0.3 now it will be 0 0.4 because now water is getting heated okay this is 0 0.4 for heating 0 0.3 for cooling so it will be 0 0.4 so just like what we did for the first part, we already have Reynolds number, we have parental number, so Nusselt number on the inside, we can get that and based on that you get uh, HI. It's, the calculation is very similar to what we did for, for the first part. You will get HI is 10800 watt per square meter Kelvin. So that is convection coefficient on the inside. Now, we also need on the outside. So for that, first we calculate Reynolds number on the outside. So I'm writing Reynolds number on the outside. So it is defined as V D over nu. So we plug numbers, velocity outside is 10 meter per second. Diameter is It is 10 millimeter so it will be 0 0.01 meter over viscosity that is given as for air 20.92 times 10 to negative 6. So this is uh, this number, actually I don't have the value but you get the Reynolds number and then we need a correlation. How Nusselt number on the outside which is HD over K and see this will be thermal conductivity of air because outside fluid is air. We are determining Nusselt number on the outside. Okay. How this is a function of Reynolds number and parental number. There is a correlation, and I gave you those correlations previously. One of those is by Churchill and Bernstein. So, if you use th that correlation, you will get this value HO is 107 watt per square meter. Cap will get this value for H on. Okay, this is convection coefficient on the outside. See what we are doing is for the internal flow, first you get the Reynolds number and then you have a correlation for internal flow, the Ditas Bolter correlation. So we got convection coefficient. And we did the same thing for outside. It is an external flow, flow over a cylinder, a cross flow over a cylinder. So we determined Reynolds number first and based on this correlation and using the Reynolds number and parental number values, you get Nusselt number that gives you the convection coefficient on the outside. Okay. And while applying this equation, uh, you will see that we are evaluating properties at the film temperature. The problem itself says that assume film temperature is 350 K. Okay, so these properties, this viscosity and also thermal conductivity, those are given at the film temperature. So we got HO. Now you use 1 over U equals 1 over HI plus 1 over HO. And this gives U is 106 watt per square meter Kelvin. And then 
see the temperature profiles now are like this so this is t infinity which is given 100 degrees c and water temperature increases from 47 to whatever so this is 47 and this is tmo so it's a single stream heat exchanger but the value of u between these two is given by this now okay. so we use the formula we used for the first part that was log tmo minus t infinity over tmi minus t infinity equals ua over m dot cp actually i'm not sure if you get a negative sign here or not uh, I think there is also a negative sign here okay, but verify if there is a negative sign you get this expression based on q equals u a delta t l m and this is also equal to mass flow rate times c p times t m o minus t m i in this case Okay, by manipulating these, you get this expression. I'm not sure if there is a negative sign or not. Please verify. After that, you just plug numbers in this and you get TMO now is 47.4 degrees C. So that is the mean temperature. So this was number 59. This was not which number was this? No, this was 57. This is 57. Let us look at 58. Is that lubricant oil its CP is given it is cooled in a counter flow heat exchanger it is cooled in a counter flow heat exchanger from 375 to 350 Kelvin by using water water inlet is at 280 Kelvin so see we are given three out of four temperatures we have 375 350 and 280 so three temperatures are given so lmtd method will work in this case easily and we are given mass flow rate for oil and water 0 0.5 and 0 0.201 okay. determine heat transfer area if overall heat transfer coefficient is 250 watt per square meter kelvin so the problem is very easy it's a counter flow heat exchanger so if first i plot temperature profile see temperature of oil changes from 375 to 350 so let me show like this so oil flows in this direction and it goes from 375 to 350k and we are given these you have mass flow rate of oil and also cp of oil these numbers are given water flows in the opposite direction and its inlet temperature is 280k so it flows in the opposite direction that will be like this and its temperature here is 280k we are also given mass flow rate of water 
and Cp of water. Okay. Cp of water is not given, but you know that is 4.187 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. We can use this number. And you are also given U is 250. So determine the heat transfer area. See, it's a very simple problem. We write Q equals UA delta T L M and this also equals okay, based on oil we can write as mass flow rate of oil times Cp of oil times change in temperature of oil. I am just taking that as 375 minus 350 so just 25 I am right away writing the number here okay. and this is also equal to mass flow rate of water Cp of water times change in temperature of water. Okay, don't take 280 minus this. We are taking Q in a way so that the number is positive. So take this temperature minus 280. So it will be temperature of water at outlet minus 280. Okay, where this temperature will be in Kelvin, the way we have taken. Okay. Now See, the method will be we are given this mass flow rate and this Cp we have this mass flow rate and this Cp so use these two to get this temperature of water at uh, outlet so you just plug numbers I'm trying to save some time but you get this number is 311.04k based on this equals this you get this so right away you should write q equals this equals this equals this so in all the ways and then you see what is given what is not given so what are you going to use so we got this temperature once we have this temperature you can get delta t l m okay you see we have all the temperatures you have these temperatures and these temperatures so evaluate delta T L M, it turns out to be 67 Kelvin. Okay. Then substitute this number here, we have this and we have U also. So this gives you A right away. Okay. So that gives you A is, you can verify the calculation if you want to, you get 1.56 square meter. Okay, so very simple. Let us do fifty nine. says determine the surface area required for a condenser having 25,000 kilogram per hour of saturated steam flow so we are given mass flow rate of steam is 25,000 kilogram per hour and it is saturated steam at 0 0.5 bar Cooling water is heated from 15 to 25 degrees C. Okay. So water is used which goes from 15 to 25 degrees C and in the process this steam condenses. So let me also write. So this cooling water, temperature of water, it goes from 15 to 25. Heat transfer coefficient is 10 kilowatt per square meter Kelvin. So that is the overall heat transfer coefficient. We are given U. U is 10 kilowatt per square meter Kelvin. 
the condenser has two water passes so see this is like a shell and tube heat exchanger and let me make a drawing so if say Okay, so this is the shell and tubes have two passes that means say they go like this that is one pass and then that is second pass and you have a bunch of tubes not one tube So this is the situation okay. so it says the condenser has two water passes with tubes of 19 millimeter OD and 1.2 millimeter ball thickness so the OD of the tube is uh, 19 millimeter and wall thickness is 1.2 find the length and number of tubes per pass so how many tubes are there okay, we have to find the number of tubes and length of tube per pass so the length of tube per pass will be this length okay, this is length per pass okay. velocity of water is 1 meter per second let me write here that as velocity of water to per second and it says take correction factor for two tube passes as 0 0.86 so correction factor we indicate that as F F is 0 0.86 and it gives other data that saturation temperature at 0.5 bar is 32.55 degrees C so that means steam was at this temperature okay, it was saturated steam so this was the temperature of steam and HFG this is enthalpy of vaporization is 20 or latent heat of vaporization it is 2560 kilojoule per kilogram at 0.5 bar and CP of water is 4.187 density of water is 1000 and we are also given that condensate is at 25 degrees C okay condensate is steam condenses and after that it is further cooled to 25 degrees C so let me clarify that first so in this heat exchanger water flows through these pipes and steam enters when it enters it is saturated steam and it is at 0.5 bar so its temperature is actually 32.55 degrees C because that is the saturation temperature at 0.5 bar and this will actually be coming out and when it comes out that is the condensate it is at 25 degrees C Okay, this is at 25 degrees C. So if, if you remember, say if I draw a pressure volume, let me draw a temperature volume diagram. If this is vapor dome, then what entered was saturated steam that was at this point, it condensed. So at constant temperature and constant pressure, it condensed like this and then it continued to cool at constant pressure. So it went like this and temperature here is 25 degrees C. Okay. So this is steam inlet, if I want to write, this is inlet of steam and this is outlet of steam. I am saying outlet of steam but it is not steam at this point. So this is inlet and this is outlet. Okay. 
and if we draw temperature profile uh, for a counter flow heat exchanger this is not a counter flow heat exchanger but if you draw for a counter flow heat exchanger see that will look like this so steam is at 32.55 degrees C and say so at this point it has become water so then it starts to cool so its temperature goes down like this okay so this is steam this temperature is 32.55 and this is 25 and say so water flows in the opposite direction it enters at 15 and exit at 25 so let's say Okay, this is flow of water. This is 15 and this is 25. Okay. That is for a counter flow heat exchanger. Okay. It will take some time to complete this problem. So you can always begin with this you write heat transfer rate of heat transfer which will be u a delta t l m okay equals we can write based on water based on water it will be mass flow rate of water times cp of water times temperature of water at outlet minus inlet okay see again this term is positive okay this temperature is 25 this is 15 so this is rate of heat transfer based on water okay and this will be equal to we should not write mass flow rate of steam times cp of steam times change in temperature don't do that because you have a phase change okay we have phase change so i'm going to just write it will be mass flow rate of steam times change in enthalpy okay, which will be enthalpy of steam at inlet minus I am saying steam at outlet it is not actually steam but I am just saying enthalpy of steam at outlet okay this expression now see our approach will be first you should see what is given and what is not given so then uh, we need to see how to solve it okay. actually u is given okay delta t l m that also we can calculate easily based on all the temperatures that are given uh, we don't have mass flow rate of water so this is not given and we have cp of water we have these temperatures for water and we don't have this area for heat transfer we have mass flow rate of steam and this change in enthalpy we are given enthalpy so we can work this out this is also given okay so now you see that in these equations we don't know a and mass flow rate of water so if we equate these two we will get mass flow rate of water and then we equate these two you will get the area and based on that we can work out how many pipes are there and uh, what is the length for each pass for the pipe okay so first let, let us look at this number this enthalpy of steam at inlet minus enthalpy of steam at outlet what this number will be see it goes from this point to this point okay. so the change in enthalpy associated with this is just hfg this hfg plus change in enthalpy associated with this okay in this region it is subcooled liquid 
and we can treat that as incompressible and it is at constant pressure okay so change in enthalpy between this point and this point is just cp times change in temperature so it is just going to be cp for water times change in temperature so this temperature is 32.55 and this temperature is 25 so it will be 32.55 minus 25 okay that is this term so this is uh, let me see this hfg is 2560 kilojoule per kilogram plus C for water is 4.187 times this temperature difference 32.55 minus 25 okay so whatever number you get in kilojoule per kilogram okay that is this change in enthalpy okay so now I'm just going to plug numbers into this equals this so you get mass flow rate of water times CP of water that is 4.187 I'm keeping in kilojoule times temperature difference for water that is 10 equals mass flow rate of steam it is 25,000 kilogram per hour so divide this with 3600 okay that becomes kilogram per second okay times this number which also is in kilojoule so this is kilojoule and this number is in kilojoule just plug this number here hsi minus hso so this gives mass flow rate of water 8 kilogram per second okay. and based on mass flow rate of water we can determine how many pipes will be you see mass flow rate of water will be equal to if there are n pipes and cross section area of each is pi by 4 its inside diameter square okay this is cross section area of each pipe times number of pipes this is the total cross section area okay times velocity of water okay that becomes volumetric flow rate times its density that is mass flow rate okay so we just plug numbers here so 429.8 equals n times pi by 4 and inside diameter of pipe is outside diameter is 19 millimeter and inside will be 19 minus 2.4 because wall thickness is 1.2 this is inside diameter of pipes through which water flows divide this with thousand when we are converting uh, millimeter to meter okay so this is diameter square okay and velocity of water that is given one meter per second so times one times density that is 1000 so this gives us n okay so this many tubes are required okay so we got n now we can use this thing equals this that will give us a so i'm writing that here again so area will be mass flow rate of water times cp of water times t water out minus in over u times delta t lm u times delta tl we have mass flow rate of water cp of water these temperatures we have okay. and uh, u is given overall heat transfer coefficient this was also given 
we need this delta T L M. Delta T L M will be delta T L M for the counterflow heat exchanger times the correction factor F. So for the counterflow heat exchanger based on the temperature profile so we have this temperature profile okay. so you can write it will be temperature difference here is 10 and here uh, I, I did not write the numbers Let's see okay I can do the calculations this delta T L M will be delta T 2 that is 10 minus delta T 1 that is 32.55 minus 25 over log 10 over this 32.55 minus 25 Okay, so we got delta T L M for a counterflow heat exchanger and multiply this with the correction factor that was given as 0.86. Okay, so that gives us delta T L M that we have to use here. Okay. And actually to be precise there is a mistake in the problem. The problem gives the value of u it says u is 10 kilowatt per square meter kelvin but u with respect to which area u depends on area okay. whether this is with respect to the inside area uh, or the outside area okay because you have pipe of thickness 1.2 millimeter so this is with respect to which area uh, that is not given that should have been given because accordingly we write u a so either both are with respect to i or both are with respect to o but that, that is not given so we'll have to make some assumption okay so we plug numbers in this we write you get a is mass flow rate of water we got that as 429.8 kilogram per second times cp of water 4.187 i'm just converting that to 4187 temperature change of water that is 10 over u u is given as 10 kilowatt per meter square kelvin so that becomes 10 times 10 to the 3 times this delta T L M whatever number you get just plug that here this gives A is 240 square meter okay so this is the area for heat transfer this is not the cross section area okay, this is for heat transfer we can write this A as uh, if there are n tubes See, each tube has perimeter pi. Now I have to make an assumption. Let us say this area is AO. So what I'm saying is this U was given was UO. But the problem did not specify, but I'm making an assumption that it was UO. So we, we are getting AO here. So this AO we can write as pi DO this is perimeter of each tube multiply with length if length is L and if this is length per pass and there are two passes so it will be twice okay so twice pi DL this is surface area for one tube and if there are n tubes multiply with n okay, so this is the area we got we already have n we have diameter of tube given 
So just plug numbers in this, that gives us L. You get L is 1.012 meter per pass. So we got the number of tubes and the length of each tube uh, per pass. Okay, we are done with sufficient problems. I am going to introduce one more method uh, for working with heat exchangers. And this method is called effectiveness NTU method or just NTU method. This is alternative approach. Instead of using the LMTD method, this is alternative approach. And this is useful if only inlet temperatures are given and LMTD can't be determined easily. Because for, for determination of LMTD, you need all four temperatures. Temperature of hot fluid and cold fluid at inlet and outlet. Okay. If three temperatures are given, you, you can determine fourth easily by energy balance and then determine LMTD. But if only two temperatures are given, let us say you are given inlet temperature of hot fluid and inlet temperature of cold fluid, then you don't have LMTD available readily and the process becomes iterative. Okay, so to avoid that, this is an alternative approach. And in this approach, first we define what is called Qmax. This is maximum possible heat transfer from heat exchanger of infinite length. The maximum possible you can get for a counterflow arrangement because that is going to actually give the maximum. I'm going to elaborate on this in a while. And we are going to use the shorthand notation instead of writing m dot h c p h we will just write as c h and m dot c c p c this will be c c and these are called heat capacity rates okay m dot time specific heat these terms are called heat capacity rates okay. so let us see what this q max is going to be Now first consider a situation in which CC is greater than CH. Okay. So the heat capacity rate for the cold fluid is greater than that for the hot fluid. And see you have based on energy balance, we have CC times change in temperature of cold fluid will be equal to CH times change in temperature of hot fluid. So, if the situation is CC is greater than CH, that means DTC will be less than DTH. Okay. DTC will be less than DTH. So, the hot fluid, you can say hot fluid experiences greater temperature change okay, it experiences greater temperature change and now consider that the heat exchanger is of infinite length okay, then it is going to experience not only greater temperature change but the maximum temperature change okay. and now you can understand if let us say the inlet temperature of hot fluid is this, this is THI and inlet temperature of cold fluid is this, that is TCI. Okay, this is this represent TCI and this is THI. Okay. 
So if the inlet temperature of hot fluid is this and inlet temperature of cold fluid is this, then if the heat exchanger is of infinite length, then the hot fluid will actually be actually be cooled to the same temperature as the inlet temperature of the cold fluid. Okay, that is what you see here. So hot fluid flows in this direction, it is like this and cold flows in this direction so it is counter flow but the outlet temperature of hot fluid becomes equal to the inlet temperature of cold fluid if heat exchanger is of infinite length and it is counter flow arrangement and you can also see that the change in temperature of the hot fluid is greater than change in temperature of cold fluid that is because cc is greater than ch okay. so for this situation of infinite length heat exchanger you can write q max the maximum heat transfer rate that is possible that will be based on hot fluid if we write it will be ch times change in temperature of hot fluid that is thi minus tci okay so thi minus tci so see the advantage is we are able to write based on inlet temperatures If you consider a different situation in which CC is less than CH, then it is going to be opposite. Then DTC will be greater than DTH. So the change in temperature of cold fluid is more than change in temperature of hot fluid. Okay. And in this case, if cold fluid enters here at this temperature, it is going to get heated to the maximum possible value that will be the inlet temperature of the hot fluid. So the cold fluid is getting heated to the inlet temperature of the hot fluid and hot fluid is flowing in this direction. So again you can write Q max which will be based on cold fluid it will be CC times TCO minus TCI but TCO is THI, cold fluid is heated to the inlet temperature of the hot fluid. So you get Q max is CC THI minus TCI. Now we can generalize these two scenarios. You can write Q max equals C min times THI minus TCI. So here you are just taking the minimum value of C. So whichever fluid has less value of this heat capacity rate m dot times cp just take that value times this change in temperature inlet temperature that is q max okay. and then effectiveness of a heat exchanger is defined like this effectiveness epsilon is actual heat transfer rate q over maximum maximum is given by this expression okay. that is the effectiveness and we can write actual heat transfer rate Q based on hot fluid or cold fluid in this way. It will be CH times THI minus THO. So this is actual. This is not maximum. Okay. So based on change in temperature of hot fluid or change in temperature of cold fluid. We can write like this. We can also define NTU that is called number of transfer units in this way NTU is UA over C min okay, the minimum value of heat capacity rate UA over C min now it turns out that we are not going to derive the expression but for any heat exchanger we can express effectiveness as a function of NTU and the ratio of C min to C max, let us call that as CR. So for any heat exchanger, effectiveness can be expressed as a function of NTU and CR. So those are available in the form of plots or also in the forms of equations and we can use those. So this method is NTU method. Uh, let me show you the formulas and plots, how they look like.
for a parallel flow heat exchanger we did not derive this but this expression can be derived okay effectiveness epsilon is 1 minus e to the power negative 1 plus cr cr is c min over c max times ntu over 1 plus cr this is for parallel flow for counter flow we get epsilon is 1 minus e to the negative 1 minus cr times ntu over 1 minus cr times e to the negative 1 minus cr times ntu this is effectiveness for counter flow uh, heat exchanger if cr is 0 we can substitute cr0 in these expressions and you will get epsilon or this effectiveness is 1 minus e to the negative NTU and this is valid for any heat exchanger okay for any heat exchanger if CR is 0 there is same effectiveness and let me explain why it is like that so CR is C mean over C max and CR equals 0 it actually means C max approaches infinity okay. so that means there is no change in temperature of one of the fluids okay. so what you have is because it's specific it is in infinite so you are saying there is no change in temperature of one of the fluids and this is the situation when you have say boiling or condensation so if you want to plot the temperature it will be like this let us say this is one temperature which remains constant and other fluid is say getting cooled so it is like this okay so this is the situation when cr is zero because the heat capacity rate for this one is actually infinite okay. so this is cr zero and for this it does not matter whether it is a parallel flow heat exchanger or counter flow or cross flow because one temperature is constant uh, effectiveness is same okay and if cr equals 1 then if you put CR equals 1 in this expression for counter flow you will get this becomes 0 over 0 okay so that is indeterminate but what you can do is you can differentiate this if you know in calculus there is that L hospitals rule differentiate this with respect to CR and this also with respect to CR and then put CR equals 1 so you get this expression then effectiveness is NTU over 1 plus NTU for counter flow okay so again see we have these expressions for parallel flow we can use this expression for counter flow we have this expression if CR is not equal to 1 if CR equals 1 we have this and if CR is 0 any heat exchanger becomes this so that is the effectiveness and we can also get these plots so these plots will have this effectiveness versus NTU for different types of heat exchangers you can have a plot that is for a parallel flow heat exchanger another plot for counter flow heat exchanger another for cross flow say another for shell and tube type with say one shell pass and two tube passes or two shell passes four tube passes so you can have this plot for different types of heat exchangers and this is how it looks like as NTU increase effectiveness increases and there are curves for different values of CR okay and 
uh, the value of effectiveness see is between 0 and 1 okay, because effectiveness is defined as q over q max so it will be between 0 and 1 and this capacity ratio heat capacity rate ratio cr this is between 0 and 1 which is defined as C min over C max and this goes from 0 to 1. And we can make several observations about these plots. One is if CR equals 0 then all flow arrangements are same. So all heat exchangers will have same effectiveness. So this curve which is for CR equals 0 is valid for all heat exchangers if CR is 0. If NTU is less than or equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.25 is around this value here. Then also all heat exchangers have similar effectiveness if NTU is less than 0.25. Another observation is counterflow heat exchanger is most effective if CR is not equal to 0. If CR equals 0, then all heat exchangers have same effectiveness. But if CR is not equal to 0, then counterflow is most effective. Okay. And for a given heat exchanger, if CR is 0, then you get maximum effectiveness. You see this curve is for CR0 and this is for CR1. And CR0 means that temperature of one fluid is not changing. So in that situation, you are going to have maximum temperature difference overall between the two fluids. So you will have okay, higher effectiveness. So CR0, you have maximum effectiveness. Okay. Now we are going to do some problems. Uh, by using this NTU method and the steps in using this method are first we evaluate CR okay this ratio and we also evaluate Q max so if we are given uh, say inlet temperature of hot and cold fluid we can determine Q max easily then we can calculate NTU based on ua over c min then we can get effectiveness because effectiveness is a function of cr and ntu we can get effectiveness and once we have effectiveness we can get other things we can get the actual heat transfer rate and the unknown temperatures uh, if we had have, have to get those temperatures and this will come based on energy balance Okay, so let us do some examples illustrating this. So let us look at number 60. So this says water at 80 degrees C enters a counterflow heat exchanger with a mass flow rate of 0.5 kilogram per second. Air its CP is given enters at 30 degrees C with a mass flow rate of 2.09 kilogram per second. So you are given the inlet temperatures of both fluids. You have their specific heats and also their mass flow rates. If the effectiveness of the heat exchanger is 0.8, the LMTD is. We are given effectiveness and we have to get LMTD. See, effectiveness is defined as Q over Q max. So this is Q. Q max 
will be C min times temperature difference. Uh, T H I minus T C I. Okay, that is Q max. Okay. So first let us look at their C values. So C for air, which is its mass flow rate. Uh, how much is mass flow rate? 2.09 kilogram per second times its specific heat. Specific heat is 1. Okay. Or I'm converting that to joules, so it becomes 1000. And C for water is its mass flow rate is 0.5 and specific heat is 4180. Okay, if you see actually they turn out to be equal. Okay, they turn out to be equal. So this is the special situation. It's a counterflow heat exchanger and their C values are equal. So that means temperature profile if you want to plot. They will be like this. Uh, water goes from 80. So water is getting cooled. So this is water and air is getting heated so this and this temperature difference is same throughout so this temperature difference is same so you can write delta t l m is actually delta t at any location It is delta T at any location. Now, we are given effectiveness and we have this C and we have these temperatures. So, we can determine Q. So, I can write Q equals epsilon C min times THI minus TC. And this is also equal to based on the LMTD method, UA delta T LM or let me write it as uh, mass flow rate of water times specific heat of water times temperature of water at inlet minus outlet okay. now if I plug numbers effectiveness is 0.8 times C. C is I'm writing as 2.09 times 1000 times THI minus TCI. This number is 80 minus 30 that is 50 equals mass flow rate of water times CP of water. Actually this term will cancel from both sides. So this term will cancel with this m dot c p of water. They are equal. Uh, so you have just temperature of water at the inlet that is 30 degrees C or 80 degrees C minus temperature of water at outlet. So this gives us temperature of water at outlet. 
you get temperature of water at outlet is 40 degrees C and now delta T L M is actually temperature difference anywhere so I can take that as temperature difference here also which will be temperature of water at outlet minus temperature of air at inlet so that becomes 40 minus 30 so you get 10 degrees so that is delta TL so again let me go through this briefly so effectiveness is q over q max we can write q max as this c min times change in temperature t h i minus t c i we saw in this case that c air and c water they are equal okay so you write q is epsilon c t h i minus t c i and this is also equal to mass flow rate of water times cp of water times change in temperature of water this term actually cancels and you get temperature of water at outlet and then delta t lm for this case is the just temperature difference between hot and cold fluid at any location okay because their heat capacity rates were equal that is why and then you get this number is 10 degrees Okay, let us see 61. This is in a parallel flow heat exchanger operating under steady state. So I'm just plotting the temperature profile. It is parallel flow, so it is going to be like this. Okay, this is hot fluid and this is cold fluid. The product of specific heat at constant pressure and mass flow rate of the hot and cold fluid are equal. So in for this case also, you have this CR, this heat capacity rate ratio is 1 the hot fluid flowing at 1 kilogram per second with cp of 4 kilojoule per kilogram kelvin this c for any fluid which is m dot times cp it will be just 1 times 4 so i am converting that to joule becomes 4000 and if you want to write units actually units will be watt per kelvin okay, that is c for hot fluid and cold fluid it is equal it enters the heat exchanger at 102 degrees c so this temperature is 102 while the cold fluid has an inlet temperature of 15 degrees c temperature here this is 15 The overall heat transfer coefficient for the heat exchanger is estimated to be 1 kilowatt per meter square Kelvin. So that is U is 1 kilowatt per meter square Kelvin. And the corresponding heat transfer surface area is 5 square meter. So here so even corresponding area is 5 square meter. Neglect heat transfer between the heat exchanger and the ambient. The heat exchanger is characterized by the following relation. So it gives you how epsilon is a function of NTU. Okay. And because CR is 1, this expression is for CR1. CR is not even there in this. The exit temperature for the cold fluid is. So we have to determine temperature of the cold fluid at outlet. Okay. 
So again, you see in this problem, it is not straightforward to get uh, LMTD because you have see these two temperatures, okay, temperatures at inlets. Uh, if you had three temperatures, then getting LMTD is easy. Okay, but now you can't get LMTD easy. So we are going to use NTU method. And we are given epsilon as a function of NTU. That relation is available. So based on the data, see NTU, which is UA over C mu. And we plug numbers in this. U is given as 1 kilowatt per square meter Kelvin. That becomes 1000. Area is 5 square meter. And C is 4000. So you get NTU is 1.25, NTU is 1.25. Now we can get effectiveness. Effectiveness is 1 minus e to the negative twice NTU over 2. So we plug number for this here and this gives effectiveness is 0.4589. Okay, we get effectiveness. Okay. See now we have to determine the unknown temperature. This in this problem we have to determine temperature, uh, this temperature. So that we do, you can write Q as epsilon Q max. And epsilon Q max, this is epsilon Q max is C min. In this case, I am just writing C because there is only one C. Uh, both are equal. Both C's are equal. So epsilon C times T H I minus T C I. Okay, this is Q. And this is equal to, I can write it based on uh, the cold fluid. It will be C for the cold fluid times change in temperature. That will be temperature of cold fluid at outlet minus its temperature at inlet. So this term is mass flow rate times specific heat for the cold fluid. So that gives us the C cancels. So you get epsilon times THI minus TCI equals TCO minus TCI. And now just plug numbers. Epsilon is 0 0.4589 temperature of hot fluid at inlet that is 102 TCI is 15 equals TCO minus 15. So the answer you get is uh, 54.92. So let me again summarize the method uh, we use when we have we work with NTU. So first we look at CR. So you see what is C min, what is C max, and what is this heat capacity rate ratio. Okay. And you can also write an expression for Q max because Q max is C min times THI minus TCI and you will see these temperatures are given okay so you have Q max and CR then you also calculate NTU based on UA over C mean okay. and then effectiveness because effectiveness depends on NTU and CR so based on that relation you get effectiveness and once you have effectiveness you have heat transfer, 
because heat transfer is epsilon q max okay so you get heat transfer and you also get unknown temperature by writing q equals c times change in temperature of that particular fluid you, you also get those unknown temperatures so these are the steps So let us look at one more problem. You see number 62. This says in a counterflow heat exchanger, oil is cooled using water. So counterflow heat exchanger, you know, one fluid goes like this, and other is like this. So oil is cooled using water. For oil, we are given mass flow rate of oil 0.8 kilogram per second. Cp for oil, 2.5 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. Inlet temperature for oil is 120 de degrees C. So this temperature is 120. Okay, this is for oil. And outlet temperature is 40. Okay, this is 40. Inlet temperature for water is 20 degrees C this temperature is 20 and outlet is 80 okay so you see in this problem actually all temperatures are given so the method of lmtd is straightforward you can get lmtd easily okay. and you are also given overall heat transfer coefficient 1600 But the problem says using NTU method. Okay, we have to solve it using NTU method and taking NTU equals 4. NTU equals 4. Calculate the mass flow rate of water. The surface area. And the effectiveness of the heat exchanger. Okay, these are the things we need to do. before doing the problem it is always good to have a mental picture of it see we are given mass flow rate of oil specific heat of oil and also change in temperature of oil so that gives us heat transfer right away so we have Q based on that data okay and that Q we can also write for water mass flow rate of water times CP of water times change in temperature of water. So that will give us mass flow rate of water. So this we will get using that. Okay. So let us first do that. So you can write Q is just mass flow rate of oil times Cp of oil times change in temperature for oil that is 120 minus 40. And this equals mass flow rate of water times Cp for water times change in temperature for water that is 60. So you plug numbers and this gives mass flow rate of water directly. Uh, you get 0 0.64. Kilogram per second. Now see, we are given NTU and you have A, U also. So we can use that to get A because by definition, 
NTU is UA over C mu. Okay. So first we have to determine C. C for oil, which will be mass flow rate for oil, that is 0 0.8 times its specific heat, that is 2500 and C for water is its mass flow rate we got 0 0.64 times its specific heat we can take 4187 okay, you have to see which one is smaller uh, let me see which one is smaller Actually, this turns out to be smaller. Okay, this turns out to be smaller. So, we are going to use this C. So, NTU that is 4 equals U. Uh, U is 1600. So, 1600 A over C min. That will be C for this one. And this becomes actually 2000 over 2000 so that gives you a that a is 5 square meter so we got a and now effectiveness effectiveness is q over q max Q we already have. Okay, based on these expressions, we already have. I'm just writing that as say. Uh, I can write based on oil. It will be C for oil times change in temperature of oil. That is 120 minus 40. Okay, that is Q. Over Q max. Q max is C min but C min is same as C oil for oil we had minimum C so this is C min times THI THI is 120 minus TCI TCI is 20 so you get 0.8 so that gives the effectiveness Okay, there is one last problem that I am going to do and then we will stop. And this is number 63. So it will take some time to do this problem. Says in a counterflow double pipe heat exchanger, water flows through a copper tube of OD 19 millimeter. So let me draw like this. So this is the tube. OD is 19 and ID is 16 millimeter. Okay, let me call this as say DI 16 and DO is 19. 
at a speed of 1.48 meter per second. So velocity of so water flows through this. And velocity of water is 1.48 meter per second. And inlet temperature is 32 degrees C. So inlet temperature of water is 32. Oil flows through annulus with OD of 30 millimeter and ID of 26 millimeter for outer steel tube. So outside this, actually I should have drawn it in a different way. What you have is, uh, so there is this copper tube. If I just draw half of this, okay, this is copper tube and outside this there is a steel tube. and oil flows through this annular region and we are given these diameters okay this diameter is uh, 26 millimeter and this outside is 30 And steel tube is insulated from outside. So there is heat transfer only between water and oil. Oil is cooled from 65 to 50 degrees C. So let me write oil goes from 65 to 50 degrees C and its mass flow rate is given 0.4 kilogram per second. The mass flow rate of oil is 0.4. Neglecting the resistance of the copper tube, so that means there is no thermal resistance due to this tube. Calculate the length required, okay, how much uh, length is required for this heat exchanger with the given data. And we are also given these things. It says fouling factor on oil side is 0 0.0008 meter square Kelvin per watt. On the water side, it is this much. And Nusselt number is given by this correlation for turbulent flow. Okay. So we have these fouling factors and the correlation for Nusselt number for turbulent flow. And we are given properties for water and oil density, specific heat, thermal conductivity, and kinematic viscosity. So those properties are key. Let us see how we are going to possibly do this problem. We will have to determine convection coefficient on the water side and oil side because convection coefficients are not given. We are given correlation for Nusselt number. So we will need to use those to determine the convection coefficient and then get the overall heat transfer coefficient U. So that is going to be a major part in this problem. Okay. Let us see once we get U, then how we can do this. So if I draw temperature profile, oil goes from 65 to 50. So let's say this is oil. It goes from 65 to 50. And water inlet temperature is 32 so water goes like this and its inlet temperature is 32 that is given and we are given mass flow rate of oil we also have specific heat of oil we are given velocity of water so based on this we can calculate mass flow rate of water okay and we have specific heat of water so, after getting u, if we do q equals ua, 
delta T L M where this equals mass flow rate of oil times Cp of oil times change in temperature of oil that is 65 minus 50 15 and this equals mass flow rate of water times Cp of water times change in temperature of water that will be temperature of water at the outlet minus inlet inlet is 30 so once we get u, you see, based on these two, uh, we can get temperature of water at outlet. And then we can use this to get this log mean temperature difference because we will have all the temperatures so we can get this. And once we have this, then these are equal so you will be able to get what this a is okay or we have to determine in this case that the length of the tube that is required we will get that length also that so the steps will be we'll first determine u and then uh, get this temperature of water on the outside and then we will be able to get that. first look at the water side which is inside we need to determine what is convection coefficient on this side okay. for that first we need to get Reynolds number so Reynolds number I'm writing that as inside which will be V times the inside diameter of the copper tube over nu and you plug numbers in this velocity of water is 1.48 the inside diameter of pipe is 16 times 10 to negative 3 in meter and uh, its kinematic viscosity is given 4.18 times 10 to negative 7 so you get this Reynolds number is 56650. Okay. So, what is the nature of flow based on this Reynolds number? It is turbulent. So before using the correlation, first we determine that okay, the flow is laminar or turbulent. So, the water flow is turbulent. So, we can use the correlation that is given. So the correlation Nusselt number on the inside that will be convection coefficient on the inside times the diameter over thermal conductivity of water okay, because inside fluid is water this is Nusselt number on inside equals 0 0.023 times Reynolds number to the power 0.8 times Prandtl number to the 0.3 okay, this is the correlation we are given thermal conductivity of water and we also have this di but actually parental number is not given but we can determine parental number parental number for water by definition parental number is nu over alpha okay. so you can write that as mu over rho or we are given nu actually we are given nu so I don't have to write it like this I can write this as nu over alpha is k over rho cp okay. and these values are given in the data we have k and also density uh, specific heat and this viscosity so just plug numbers in this the numbers that are given and you will see that parental number is for water turns out to be 2.83 okay. 
So we can plug this number in this equation. We also have thermal conductivity and diameter that gives us HI is 7666 watt per square meter Kelvin. So that was water side. Now let us look on the oil side which is outside. So the situation is like this, if you look at the cross section, so this is inside diameter of the copper tube, this is outside diameter of the copper tube and in between, in this pipe you have water flowing and then there is steel tube outside it. Okay, this is the region where you have oil okay, on the outside. So we are going to do calculation for this. Okay. So how to get Reynolds number for this? So it is not like a circular pipe on the outside. We have to get the hydraulic diameter. Okay. Reynolds number is defined based on hydraulic diameter. And hydraulic diameter is 4 times cross section area over perimeter and for this case it will turn out to be this diameter which is given as 26 millimeter so 26 minus this diameter so outside diameter minus minus inside diameter 26 minus 19 so you get 7 millimeter Okay, that will be the hydraulic diameter. Okay. And we calculate Reynolds number, this is on the outside based on hydraulic diameter. That will be V times this hydraulic diameter over nu. And let me see if we are given velocity for oil. we are given mass flow rate of oil we can use that to get the velocity so mass flow rate of oil that is uh, 0.4 kilogram per second okay. this equals cross section area that will be pi by 4 times this is 26 and this is 19 so 26 square minus 19 square and this is in millimeter so if I convert this to meter you have to get another 10 to minus 6. So this is pi by 4 d square minus d square that is this annular area okay. times velocity of oil say v times its density. Density is given as 850. Okay, so based on this you get V. Uh, you get V is 1.9 meter per second. And we can substitute that V here. So it will be 1.9 times hydraulic diameter 7 times 10 to negative 3 over this viscosity for oil is 7.44 times 10 to negative 6 and number you get is 1787 okay, so this Reynolds number is 1787 what does that mean okay, this is less than 2300 so the flow is laminar actually So the oil flow is laminar. The correlation that is given is for a turbulent flow. So that correlation is not valid for this case. Okay. And let me clarify one more thing. Actually for a circular pipe, its Reynolds number can also be written as 4m dot 
over pi d mu. Don't use this formula uh, for the annulus. Don't say that Reynolds number based on hydraulic diameter will be 4 m dot over pi d h mu. No. This is for a circular tube. For a for any other configuration, you use the formula V d over nu and then get V based on mass flow rate, rate just like we got here and then evaluate it. Okay, don't use this formula. This was only for a uh, circular tube. It turned out to be that way. Okay. So, okay, now the flow of oil is laminar. So, outside is insulated. This is insulated. But what will be the Nusselt number here for heat transfer here between this surface and this? Okay. Actually, no information is given in the problem. But for laminar flow, the Nusselt number is in the range of 5. So due to lack of information here, I am going to take Nusselt number on the outside is 5. Okay, it is in the range of 5. It could be, if you do elaborate calculation, it is going to depend on the ratio of diameters and some other things. And there are tables that give us this data. But it is not given for this problem. I know it is in the range of 5, so I am just taking that value. Okay. So based on this, because the flow was laminar, we can write Nusselt number on the outside which is for oil, which will be defined as convection coefficient on the outside times hydraulic diameter over this is thermal conductivity of oil and this is h times hydraulic diameter is 7 millimeter so 7 times 10 to negative 3 over thermal conductivity of oil 0.138 so you and this thing is we assume this is 5 so you get this convection coefficient on the outside is 98.57 watt per square meter Kelvin. Okay, so we got this H. Okay, so we have convection coefficient on the inside and outside. Okay. Now I'm going to determine the temperature of water at outlet. Based on mass balance, based on energy balance, you write mass flow rate of water times Cp of water times temperature of water at outlet minus temperature of water at inlet equals mass flow rate of oil Cp of oil times temperature of oil at inlet minus temperature of oil at outlet because oil is the hot fluid and water is the cold fluid. So this is just energy balance on that. For mass flow rate of water, you can write the cross section area pi by 4 times this is inside diameter of the copper tube because water flows through copper tube. So pi by 4 d square times density of water times velocity of water. Okay, this is mass flow rate of water. And we are given these numbers. You have this diameter, density, and velocity. We have Cp, we also have this Cp, you have this mass flow rate. So you have to just plug numbers in this. That gives us temperature of water at outlet is 41.15 degrees C. Okay. 41.15 degrees C. Now we can determine LMTT. So the temperature profile is like this now for oil it goes from 65 to 50 and water from 30 to, to 41.15 this is temperature so based on this you determine LMTD
it turns out to be 20.7 degrees. Okay. And now we can write Q equals U A delta T L M and this is also equal to because a mass flow rate of oil times Cp of oil times temperature of oil at inlet minus outlet and plug numbers in this it turns out to be 11.34 times 10 to the 3 watt and we have delta T L M already available so this gives us U A you get UA is 547.8 and units are watt per Kelvin. Okay, we got UA. See, I'm keeping U and A together because if you separate them, we have to say with respect to which area. You can say UIAI or UOAO. So, with respect to which area, if we keep them together, then we don't have to specify that. Now, I am drawing the thermal circuit for heat transfer between inside and outside. See the resistance you will have starting from this temperature. There is convection here and then there is also fouling factor here that is given on the water side. Then conduction in this there is no resistance the problem says neglect that but then there is fouling here we have to consider that and then there is convection here okay so we have convection fouling and again fouling and convection so we can draw a thermal circuit okay assuming one dimensional radial it will be convection on the inside that resistance will be 1 over HI times AI area on the inside that will be 2 pi RIL. Okay, L is the length of the tube and this RI is the inside radius of the copper tube through which water flows. Then there is fouling resistance on the water side that will be if its value is rf double prime on the water side divide this with area that is 2 pi rif that is this resistance there is no resistance due to copper tube because that is to be neglected then fouling resistance on the oil side that will be rf double prime on the oil side over area but area there is 2 pi r o l okay this is outside radius of the copper tube and then convection it will be 1 over h o times 2 pi r o l okay so these are the resistances so if we sum them so this plus this plus this plus this we have u a or 1 over u a equals sum of all these resistances that is this total resistance so we plug numbers in this and you get 1 over One over u is five forty seven point eight, okay. uh, and for this area, no u a is five forty seven point eight. Okay, this is one over u a. Okay. This equals this whole thing when you evaluate it, it turns out to be one over l times zero point one nine six. Okay, so please verify this. You just have to plug all the numbers here. It, it will turn out to be this. And this gives us L. 
we get L is 107.37 meter. Okay. okay, so this problem was more elaborate in the sense that for the flow of water in the copper tube, first we had to determine the convection coefficient. And for that, first you determine the Reynolds number, then see if it is turbulent, you are using the correlation that is valid for turbulent flow for Nusselt number that gives you convection coefficient. And we do the same thing on the oil side, on the outside, but flow turned out to be laminar there. We use hydraulic diameter, it turned out to be laminar and Nusselt number for laminar, we assumed it is 5. That gives us convection coefficient on the oil side. And then we used formula for energy balance, that is this M dot W, C P W times temperature change and same thing for oil and U A delta T L M, all these are equal to Q. We just use these. So first we determine the unknown temperature, then that way we got this delta T L M and then from this we got U A and then we use this uh, thermal circuit with all the resistances uh, to get this. But in many problems, uh, you will get that neglect the thickness of the pipe, then Ri equals Ro. Okay, then all these will cancel. You see this 2 pi Ril, 2 pi Ril, okay, this term, this term, they all are same, they all are A. So your expression becomes very simple. You can write 1 over U equals 1 over Hi plus this resistance here plus this resistance plus 1 over h that equals 1 over u. okay but in this problem areas were given they were different so we considered their effect and this is the answer okay, okay so we are done with this topic just finally one more type of heat exchanger i want to introduce that is regenerative heat exchanger and in this type of heat exchangers, fluids pass through a matrix. So there is a matrix which has very high heat capacity. Okay, so it's it's a solid matrix. So it's mass times specific heat that is very high. And fluid passes through this alternatively. One fluids fluid heats it and other cools it. And as an example, see this is the arrangement. So hot fluid is flowing on this side and cold fluid is flowing on this side and this is the matrix and it is rotating. So you can see that fluid will pass through the th this section of the matrix, it will heat it but then this section of the matrix, it will come here and the cold uh, fluid will flow over it. Okay, so there is heat transfer from the hot fluid to the matrix and from matrix to the cold fluid. So that is regenerative type of heat exchanger. And this is an example of what is called a Jungstrom uh, heat exchanger or Jungstrom air preheater. Okay, so we are done with this topic and I'm going to stop at this point.